Hello friends and welcome to a collection of short stories, volume 1. Several of you have told me that 30 minute stories are just not long enough, that you prefer longer readings. So for those of you who prefer those longer readings, I present you with this collection of recent narrations to make a continuous five-hour reading. A list of individual stories can be found in the description below. This recording is available with, as well as without, the sounds of gentle rain. Let us unwind. Find a comfortable and safe place to relax. Your bed, your sofa, your favorite chair. And let us begin these stories. Akin to Love David Hartley had dropped in to pay a neighborly call on Josephine Elliot. It was well along in the afternoon, and outside, in the clear crispness of the Canadian winter, the long blue shadows from the tall firs behind the house were falling over the snow. It was a frosty day, and all the windows of every room where there was no fire were covered with silver palms. But the big, bright kitchen was warm and cozy, and somehow seemed to David more tempting than ever before. And that is saying a good deal. He had an uneasy feeling that he had stayed long enough and ought to go. Josephine was knitting at a long grey sock with doubly aggressive energy, and that was a sign that she was talked out. As long as Josephine had plenty to say, her plump white fingers, where her mother's wedding ring was lost in dimples, moved slowly among her needles. When conversation flagged, she fell to her work as furiously as if a husband and half a dozen sons were waiting for its completion. David often wondered in his secret soul what Josephine did with all the interminable grey socks she knitted. Sometimes he concluded that she put them in the home missionary barrels. Again, that she sold them to her hired man. At any rate, they were very warm and comfortable looking, and David sighed as he thought of the deplorable state his own socks were generally in. When David sighed, Josephine took alarm. She was afraid David was going to have one of his attacks of foolishness. She must head him off some way. So she rolled up the grey sock, stabbed the big pudgy ball with her needles, and said she guessed she'd get the tea. David got up. Now, you're not going before tea said Josephine hospitably. I'll have it all ready in no time. I ought to go home, I suppose, said David with the air and tone of a man dallying with a great temptation. Still I'll be waiting tea for me, and there's the stock to tend to. I guess Scylla won't wait long, said Josephine. She did not intend it at all, but there was a certain scornful ring in her voice. You must stay. I've a fancy for company to tea. David sat down again. He looked so pleased that Josephine went down on her knees behind the stove, ostensibly to get a stick of firewood, but really to hide her smile. I suppose he's tickled to death to think of getting a good square meal. After the starvation rations, Scylla puts him on, she thought. 
but Josephine misjudged David just as much as he misjudged her. She had really asked him to stay to tea out of pity, but David thought it was because she was lonesome, and he held that as an encouraging sign. And he was not thinking about getting a good meal either. Although his dinner had been such a one as only Silla Hartley could get up. As he leaned back in his cushioned chair and watched Josephine bustling about the kitchen, he was glorying in the fact that he could spend another hour with her and sit opposite to her at the table while she poured his tea for him and passed him the biscuits. Just as if, just as if. Here Josephine looked straight at him, with such intent and stern brown eyes, that David felt she must have read his thoughts, and he colored guiltily. But Josephine did not even notice that he was blushing. She had only paused to wonder whether she would bring out cherry or strawberry preserved, and having decided on the cherry, took her piercing gaze from David without having seen him at all. But he allowed his thoughts no more vagaries. Josephine set the table with her mother's wedding china. She used it because it was the anniversary of her mother's wedding day, but David thought it was out of compliment to him. And as he knew quite well that Josephine prized that china beyond all her other earthly possessions, he stroked his smooth-shaven, dimpled chin with the air of a man to whom is offered a very subtly sweet homage. Josephine whisked in and out of the pantry, and up and down cellar, and with every whisk a new dainty was added to the table. Josephine, as everybody in Meadowby admitted, was past mistress in the noble art of cookery. Once upon a time, rash matrons and ambitious young wives had aspired to rival her, but they had long ago realized the vanity of such efforts, and dropped comfortably back to second place. Josephine felt an artist's pride in her table when she set the teapot on its stand and invited David to sit in. There were pink slices of cold tongue, and crisp green pickles, and spiced gooseberry, the recipe for which Josephine had invented herself, and which had taken first prize at the provincial exhibition for six consecutive years. There was a lemon pie, which was a symphony in gold and silver, biscuits as light and white as snow, and moist, plummy cubes of fruitcake. There was the ruby-tinted cherry preserve, a mound of amber jelly, and, to crown all, steaming cups of tea in flavor and fragrance unequaled. And Josephine, too, sitting at the head of the table, with her smooth, glossy crimps of black hair and cheeks as rosy clear as they had been twenty years ago, when she had been a slender slip of girlhood, and bashful young David Hartley had looked at her over his hymn book in prayer meeting, and tramped all the way home a few feet behind her, because he was too shy to go boldly up and ask if he might see her home. All taken together, what wonder if David lost his head over that tea table and determined to ask Josephine the same old question once more. It was eighteen years since he had asked it for the first time, and two years since the last. He would try his luck again. Josephine was certainly more gracious than he remembered her to ever have been before. When the meal was over, Josephine cleared the table and washed the dishes. When she had taken a dry towel and sat down by the window to polish a china, David understood that his opportunity had come. He moved over and sat down beside her on the sofa 
by the window. Outside, the sun was setting in a magnificent arch of light and color over the snow-clad hills and deep blue St. Lawrence Gulf. David grasped at the sunset as an introductory factor. Isn't that fine, Josephine, he said admiringly. It makes me think of that piece of poetry that used to be in the old fifth reader when we went to school. Do you mind how the teacher used to dwell us up in it on Friday afternoons? It began, Slow sinks, more lovely ere his races run, Along Moria's hills the setting sun. Then David declaimed the whole passage in a sing-song tone, accompanied by a few crude gestures, recalled from long-ago schoolboy elocution. Josephine knew what was coming. Every time David proposed to her, he had begun by reciting poetry. She twirled her towel around the last plate resignedly. If it had to come, the sooner it was over, the better. Josephine knew by experience that there was no heading David off, despite his shyness, when he had once got along as far as the poetry. But it's going to be for the last time, she said determinedly. I'm going to settle this question so decidedly tonight that there'll never be a repetition. When David had finished his quotation, he laid his hand on Josephine's plump arm. Josephine, he said huskily, I suppose you couldn't, could you now? Make up your mind to have me. I wish you would, Josephine. I wish you would. Don't you think you could, Josephine? Josephine folded up her towel, crossed her hands on it, and looked her wooer squarely in the eyes. David Hartley, she said deliberately, what makes you go on asking me to marry you every once in a while, when I've told you times out of mind that I can't and won't? Because I can't help hoping that you'll change your mind through time, David replied meekly. Well, you just listen to me. I will not marry you. That is in the first place. And in the second, this is to be final. It has to be. You are never to ask me this again under any circumstances. If you do, I will not answer you. I will not let on I hear you at all. But, and Josephine spoke very slowly and impressively, I will never speak to you again. Never. We are good friends now, and I like you real well, and I like to have you drop in for a neighborly chat as often as you wish to. But there'll be an end, short and sudden, to that, if you don't mind what I say. Oh, Josephine, ain't that rather hard, protested David feebly. It seemed terrible to be cut off from all hope, with such finality as this. I mean every word of it, returned Josephine calmly. You'd better go home now, David. I always feel as if I'd like to be alone for a spell after a disagreeable experience. David obeyed sadly and put on his cap and overcoat. Josephine kindly warned him not to slip and break his legs on the porch, because the floor was as icy as anything and she even lighted the candle and held it up at the kitchen door to guide him safely out. David, as he trudged sorrowfully homeward across the fields, carried with him the mental picture of a plump, sonsy woman in a trim dress of plum-colored homespun and ruffled blue check apron, hallowed by candlelight. It was not a very romantic vision, perhaps, but to David it was more beautiful than anything else in the world. 
When David was gone, Josephine shut the door with a light shiver. She blew out the candle, for it was not yet dark enough to justify artificial light to her thrifty mind. She thought the big empty house, in which she was the only living thing, was very lonely. It was so still, except for the slow ticking of the grandfather's clock and the soft purr and crackle of the wood in the stove. Josephine sat down by the window. I wish some of the sentinels would run down, she said aloud. If David hadn't been so ridiculous, I'd have got him to stay the evening. He can be good company when he likes. He's real well read and intelligent, and he must have dismal times at home, there with nobody but Zilla. She looked across the yard to the little house at the other side of it, where the French-Canadian hired man lived, and watched the purple spiral of smoke from its chimney curling up against the crocus sky. Would she run over to see Miss Leon Bruyere and her little black-eyed, brown-skinned baby? No, they never knew what to say to each other. If twasn't so cold, I'd go up and see Ida, she said. As it is, I guess I'd better fall back on my knitting. For I saw Jimmy Sentner's toes sticking through his socks the other day. How set back poor David did look, to be sure. But I think I've settled that marrying notion of his once for all, and I'm glad of it. She said the same thing next day to Mrs. Tom Sentner, who had come down to help her pick her geese. They were at work in the kitchen, with a big tub full of feathers between them, and on the table a row of dead birds, which Leon had killed and brought in. Josephine was enveloped in a shapeless print wrapper, and had an apron tied tightly around her head to keep the down out of her beautiful hair, of which she was rather proud. What do you think, Ida? she said with a hearty laugh at the recollection. David Hartley was here to tea last night and asked me to marry him again. There's a persistent man for you. I can't brag of ever having had many bows, but I've certainly had my fair share of proposals. Mrs. Tom did not laugh. Her thin little face, with its faded prettiness, looked as if she never laughed. Why won't you marry him? she said fretfully. Why should I? retorted Josephine. Tell me that, Ida Sentner. Because it is high time you were married, said Mrs. Tom decisively. I don't believe in women living single, and I don't see what better you can do than take David Hartley. Josephine looked at her sister with the interested expression of a person who is trying to understand some mental attitude in another, which is a standing puzzle to her. Ida's evident wish to see her married always amused Josephine. Ida had married very young, and for fifteen years her life had been one of drudgery and ill health. Tom Sentner was a lazy, shiftless fellow. He neglected his family and was drunk half his time. Meadowby people said that he beat his wife when on the spree, but Josephine did not believe that, because she did not think that Ida could keep from telling her if it were so. Ida Sentner was not given to bearing her trials in silence. Had it not been for Josephine's assistance, Tom Sentner's family would have stood an excellent chance of starvation. Josephine practically kept them, and her generosity never failed or stinted. She fed and clothed her nephews and nieces, and all the grey socks whose destination puzzled David. So much went to the Sentners. 
As for Josephine herself, she had a good farm, a comfortable house, a plump bank account, and was an independent, unworried woman. And yet, in the face of all this, Mrs. Tom Sentner could bewail the fact that Josephine had no husband to look out for her. Josephine shrugged her shoulders and gave up the conundrum, merely saying ironically in reply to her sister's remark, And go to live with Scylla Hartley? You know very well you wouldn't have to do that. Ever since John Hartley's wife at the creek died, he's been wanting Scylla to go and keep house for him. And if David got married, Scylla'd go quick. Catch her staying there if you were mistress. And David has such a beautiful house. It's ten times finer than yours. Though I don't deny yours is comfortable. And his farm is the best in Meadowby. And joins yours. Think what a beautiful property did make together. You're all right now, Josephine. But what will you do when you get old and have nobody to take care of you? I declare the thought worries me at night till I can't sleep. I should have thought you had enough worries of your own to keep you awake at nights without taking over any of mine, said Josephine dryly. As for old age, it's a good way off for me yet. When your Jack gets old enough to have some sense, he can come here and live with me. But I'm not going to marry David Hartley. You can depend on that, Ida, my dear. I wish you could have heard him rhyming off that poetry last night. It doesn't seem to matter much what piece he recites. First thing that comes into his head, I reckon. I remember one time he went clean through that hymn beginning... Hark from the tombs of doleful sound. And two years ago, it was to marry in heaven, as lackadaisical as you please. I never had such a time to keep from laughing, but I managed it, for I wouldn't hurt his feelings for the world. No, I haven't any intention of marrying anybody. But if I had, it wouldn't be dear old sentimental, easy-going David. Mrs. Tom thumped a plucked goose down on the bench, with an expression which said that she, for one, wasn't going to waste any more words on an idiot. Easy-going indeed. Did Josephine consider that a drawback? Mrs. Tom sighed. If Josephine, she thought, had put up with Tom Sentner's tempers for fifteen years, she would know how to appreciate a good-natured man at his real value. The cold snap which had set in on the day of David's call lasted and deepened for a week. On Saturday evening, when Mrs. Tom came down for a jug of cream... The mercury of the little thermometer thumping against Josephine's porch was below zero. The gulf was no longer blue, but white with ice. Everything outdoors was crackling and snapping. Inside, Josephine had kept roaring fires all through the house, but the only place really warm was the kitchen. Wrap your head up well, Ida she said anxiously when Mrs. Tom rose to go. You've got a bad cold. There's a cold going, said Mrs. Tom. Everyone has it. David Hartley was up at our place today, barking terrible. A real churchyard cough, as I told him. He never takes any care of himself. He said Scylla had a bad cold too. Won't she be cranky while it lasts? Josephine sat up late that night to keep fires on. She finally went to bed in the little room opposite the big hall stove. And she slept at once, and she dreamed that the thumps of the thermometer flapping in the wind against the wall outside grew louder 
and more insistent until they woke her up. Someone was pounding on the porch door. Josephine sprang out of bed and hurried on her wrapper and felt shoes. She had no doubt that some of the sentinels were sick. They had a habit of getting sick about that time of night. She hurried out and opened the door, expecting to see hulking Tom Sentner, or perhaps Ida herself, big-eyed and hysterical. But David Hartley stood there, panting for breath. The clear moonlight showed that he had no overcoat on, and he was coughing hard. Josephine, before she spoke a word, clutched him by the arm and pulled him in out of the wind. For pity's sake, David Hartley, what is the matter? Scylla's awful sick, he gasped. I came here because twas nearest. Oh, won't you come over, Josephine? I've got to go for the doctor, and I can't leave her alone. She's suffering dreadful. I know you and her ain't on good terms, but you'll come, won't you? Of course I will, said Josephine sharply. I'm not a barbarian, I hope, to refuse to go to help of a sick person, if twas my worst enemy. I'll go in and get ready, and you go straight to the hall stove and warm yourself. There's a good fire in it yet. What on earth do you mean, starting out on a bitter night like this without an overcoat, or even mittens? And you with a cold like that? I never thought of them. I was so frightened, said David apologetically. I just lit up a fire in the kitchen stove as quick as I could and run. It rattled me to hear Scylla moaning, so as you could hear her all over the house. You need someone to look after you as bad as Scylla does, said Josephine severely. In a very few minutes she was ready, and with a basket packed full of homely remedies. For like as not, there'll be no putting one's hand on anything there, she muttered. She insisted on wrapping her big plaid shawl around David's head and neck, and made him put on a pair of mittens she had knitted for Jack Sentner. Then she locked the door and started across the gleaming, crusted field. It was so slippery that Josephine had to cling to David's arm to keep her feet. In the rapture of supporting her, David almost forgot everything else. In a few minutes, they had passed under the bare, glistening boughs of the poplars on David's lawn, and for the first time Josephine crossed the threshold of David Hartley's house. Years ago, in her girlhood, when the Hartleys lived in the old house and there were half a dozen girls at home, Josephine had frequently visited there. All the Hartley girls liked her, except Scylla. She and Scylla never got on together. When the other girls had married and gone, Josephine gave up visiting there. She had never been inside the new house, and she and Scylla had not spoken to each other for years. Scylla was a sick woman too sick to be anything but civil to Josephine. David started at once for the doctor at the creek, and Josephine saw that he was well wrapped up before she let him go. Then she mixed up a mustard plaster for Zilla, and sat down by the bedside to wait. When Mrs. Tom Sentner came down the next day, she found Josephine busy making flaxseed poultices, with her lips set in a line that betokened she had made up her mind to some disagreeable course of duty. Scylla has got pneumonia bad, she said, in reply to Mrs. Tom's inquiries. The doctor's here, and Mary Bell from the creek. She'll wait on Scylla, but there'll have to be another woman here to see to the work. I reckon I'll stay. I suppose it's my duty and I don't see who else could be got. You can send Mummy and Jack down to stay at my house. 
until I can go back. I'll run over every day and keep my eye on things. At the end of the week, Scylla was out of danger. Saturday afternoon, Josephine went over home to see how Mummy and Jack were getting on. She found Mrs. Tom there, and the latter promptly dispatched Jack and Mummy to the post office that she might have an opportunity to hear Josephine's news. I've had an awful week of it, Ida, said Josephine solemnly, as she sat down by the stove and put her feet up on the glowing hearth. I suppose Scylla is pretty cranky to wait on, said Mrs. Tom sympathetically. Oh, it isn't Scylla. Mary Bell looks after her. No, it's the house. I never lived in such a place of dust and disorder in my born days. I'm sorrier for David Hartley than I ever was for anyone before. I suppose he's used to it, said Mrs. Tom with a shrug. I don't see how anyone could ever get used to it, groaned Josephine. And David used to be so particular when he was a boy. The minute I went there the other night, I took in that kitchen with a lock. I don't believe the paint has even been washed since the house was built. I honestly don't, and I wouldn't like to be called upon to swear when the floor was scrubbed either. The corners were just full of rolls of dust. You could have shoveled it out. I swept it out next day, and I thought I'd be choked. As for the pantry, well, the less said about that, the better. And it's the same all through the house. You could write your name on everything. I couldn't so much as clean up. Scylla was so sick there couldn't be a bit of noise made. I did manage to sweep and dust, and I cleaned out the pantry. And, of course, I saw that the meals were nice and well cooked. You should have seen David's face. He looked as if he couldn't get used to having things clean and tasty. I darned his socks. He hadn't a whole pair to his name. And I've done everything I could to give him a little comfort. Not that I could do much. If Scylla heard me moving round, she'd send Mary Bell out to ask what the matter was. When I wanted to go upstairs, I'd have to take off my shoes and tiptoe up on my stocking feet, so she wouldn't know it. And I'll have to stay there another fortnight yet. Scylla won't be able to sit up till then. I don't really know if I can stand it without falling too and scrubbing the house from garret to cellar in spite of her. Mrs. Tom Sentner did not say much to Josephine. To herself, she said complacently, She's sorry for David. Well, I've always heard that pity was akin to love. We'll see what comes of this. Josephine did manage to live through that fortnight. One morning she remarked to David at the breakfast table, Well, I think that Mary Bell will be able to attend to the work after today, David. I will guess I'll go home tonight. David's face clouded over. Well, I suppose we oughtn't to keep you any longer, Josephine. I'm sure it's been awful good of you to stay this long. I don't know what we'd have done without you. You're welcome, said Josephine shortly. Don't go for to walk home, said David. The snow is too deep. I'll drive you over when you want to go. I'll not go before the evening, said Josephine slowly. David went out to his work gloomily. For three weeks he had been living in comfort. His wants were carefully attended to. His meals were well cooked and served. And everything was bright and clean. And more than all, Josephine had been there, with her cheerful smile and companionable ways. Well, it was all ended now. Josephine sat at the breakfast table long after David had gone out. 
She scowled at the sugar bowl and shook her head savagely at the teapot. I'll have to do it, she said at last. I'm so sorry for him that I can't do anything else. She got up and went to the window, looking across the snowy field to her own home, nestled between the grove of firs and the orchard. It's awful snug and comfortable, she said regretfully, and I've always felt set on being free and independent. But it's no use. I'd never have a minute's peace of mind again, thinking of David living here in dirt and disorder, and him so particular and tidy by nature. No, it's my duty, plain and clear, to come here and make things pleasant for him. The pointing of providence, as you might say. The worst of it is, I'll have to tell him so myself. He'll never dare to mention the subject again, after what I said to him that night he proposed last. I wish I hadn't been so dreadful emphatic. Now I've got to say it myself, if it is ever said, but I'll not begin by quoting poetry. That's one thing sure. Josephine threw back her head, crowned with the shining braids of jet black hair, and laughed heartily. She bustled back to the stove and poked up the fire. I'll have a bit of corned beef and cabbage for dinner, she said, and I'll make David that pudding he's so fond of. After all, it's kind of nice to have someone to plan and think for. It always did seem like a waste of energy to fuss over cooking things when there was nobody but myself to eat them. Josephine sang over her work all day, and David went about his with the face of a man who is going to the gallows without benefit of clergy. When he came in to supper at sunset, his expression was so woe-begone that Josephine had to dodge into a pantry to keep from laughing outright. She relieved her feelings by pounding the dresser with the potato masher, and then went primly out and took her place at the table. The meal was not a success from a social point of view. Josephine was nervous, and David glum. Mary Bell globbed down her food with her usual haste, and then went away to carry Zilla hers. Then David said reluctantly, If you want to go home now, Josephine, I'll hitch up Red Rob and drive you over. Josephine began to plate the tablecloth. She wished again that she had not been so emphatic on the occasion of his last proposal. Without replying to David's suggestion, she said crossly. Josephine always spoke crossly when she was especially in earnest. I want to tell you what I think about Zilla. She's getting better, but she's had a terrible shaking up. And it's my opinion that she won't be good for much all winter. She won't be able to do any hard work, that's certain. If you want my advice... I tell you fair and square that I think she'd better go off for a visit as soon as she's fit. She thinks so herself. Clementine wants her to go and stay a spell with her in town. It would be just the thing for her. She can go if she wants to, of course, said David dully. I can get along by myself for a spell. There is no need of your getting along by yourself, said Josephine more crossly than ever. I'll, I'll come here and keep house for you if you like. David looked at her uncomprehendingly. Wouldn't people kind of gossip, he asked hesitatingly. Not but what. I don't see what they'd have to gossip about broke in Josephine, if we were married. David sprang to his feet with such haste that he almost upset the table. Josephine, do you mean that? he exclaimed. Of course I mean it, she said 
in a perfectly savage tone. Now, for pity's sake, don't say another word about it just now. I can't discuss it for a spell. Go out to your work. I want to be alone for a while. For the first and last time, David disobeyed her. Instead of going out, he strode around the table, caught Josephine masterfully in his arms, and kissed her. And Josephine, after a second's hesitation, kissed him in return. Charlotte's Ladies Just as soon as dinner was over at the asylum, Charlotte sped away to the gap in the fence, the northwest corner gap. There was a gap in the southeast corner too. The asylum fence was in a rather poor condition. But the southeast gap was interesting only after tea and it was never at any time quite as interesting as the Northwest Gap. Charlotte ran as fast as her legs could carry her, for she did not want any of the other orphans to see her. As a rule, Charlotte liked the company of the other orphans and was a favorite with them, but somehow she did not want them to know about the gaps. She was sure they would not understand. Charlotte had discovered the gaps only a week before. They had not been there in the autumn, but the snowdrifts had lain heavily against the fence all winter. And one spring day, when Charlotte was creeping through the shrubbery in the northwest corner, in search of the little yellow daffodils that always grew there in the spring, she found a delightful space where a board had fallen off, whence she could look out on a bit of woodsy road, with a little footpath winding along by the fence under the wide-spreading boughs of the asylum trees. Charlotte felt a wild impulse to slip out and run fast and far down to that lovely, sunny, tempting, fenceless road. But that would have been wrong, for it was against the asylum rules. And Charlotte, though she hated most of the asylum rules, with all her heart, she never disobeyed or broke them. So she subdued the vagrant longing with a sigh, and sat down among the daffodils to peer wistfully out of the gap, and feast her eyes on this glimpse of the world where there were no brick walls and prim walks and never varying rules. Then, as Charlotte watched, the pretty lady with the blue eyes came along the footpath. Charlotte had never seen her before and hadn't the slightest idea in the world who she was. But that was what she called her as soon as she saw her. The lady was so pretty, with lovely blue eyes that were very sad, although somehow as you looked at them you felt that they ought to be laughing, merry eyes instead. At least Charlotte thought so, and wished at once that she knew how to make them laugh. Besides, the lady had lovely golden hair, and the most beautiful pink cheeks, and Charlotte who had mouse-colored hair and any number of freckles, had an unbounded admiration for golden locks and rose-leaf complexions. The lady was dressed in black, which Charlotte didn't like, principally because the matron of the asylum wore black, and Charlotte didn't exactly like the matron. When the pretty lady with the blue eyes had gone by, Charlotte drew a long breath. If I could pick out a mother, I'd pick out one that looked just like her, she said. Nice things sometimes happen close together, even in an orphan asylum. And that very evening, 
Charlotte discovered the southeast gap and found herself peering into the most beautiful garden you could imagine. A garden where daffodils and tulips grew, in great ribbon-like beds, and there were hedges of white and purple lilacs, and winding paths under blossoming trees. It was such a garden as Charlotte had pictured in happy dreams and never expected to see in real life. And yet, here it had been all the time, divided from her only by a high board fence. I wouldn't have supposed there could be such a lovely place so near an orphan asylum, mused Charlotte. It's the very loveliest place I ever saw. Oh, I do wish I could go and walk in it. Well, I do declare, if there isn't a lady in it too. Sure enough, there was a lady, helping an unruly young vine to run in the way it should go over a little arbor. Charlotte instantly named her the tall lady with the black eyes. She was not nearly so young or so pretty as the lady with the blue eyes, but she looked very kind and jolly. I'd like her for an aunt, reflected Charlotte, not for a mother. Oh no, not for a mother, but for an aunt. I know she'd make a splendid aunt. And oh, just look at her cat. Charlotte looked at the cat with all her might and mane. She loved cats, but cats were not allowed in an orphan asylum. Although Charlotte sometimes wondered if there were no orphan kittens in the world, which would be appropriate for such an institution. The tall lady's cat was so big and furry, with a splendid tail and elegant stripes. A very handsome cat, Charlotte called him mentally, seeing the capitals as plainly as if they had been printed out. Charlotte's fingers tingled to stroke his glossy coat, but she folded them sternly together. You know you can't, she said to herself reproachfully. So what is the use of wanting to, Charlotte Turner? You ought to be thankful just to see the garden and a very handsome cat. Charlotte watched the tall lady and the cat until they went away into a fine big house further up the garden. Then she sighed and went back through the cherry trees to the asylum playground, where the other orphans were playing games. But somehow... Games had lost their flavor compared with those fascinating gaps. It did not take Charlotte long to discover that the pretty lady always walked past the Northwest Gap about one o'clock every day, and never at any other time, at least at no other time when Charlotte was free to watch her and that the tall lady was almost always in her garden at five in the afternoon, accompanied by the very handsome cat, pruning and trimming some of her flowers. Charlotte never missed being at the gaps at the proper times, if she could possibly manage it, and her heart was full of dreams about her two ladies. But the other orphans thought all the fun had gone out of her, and the matron noticed her absent-mindedness and dosed her with sulfur and molasses for it. Charlotte took the dose meekly, as she took everything else. It was all part and parcel with being an orphan in an asylum. But if the pretty lady with the blue eyes was my mother, she wouldn't make me swallow such dreadful stuff, sighed Charlotte. I don't believe even the tall lady with the black eyes would, though perhaps she might, aunts not being quite as good as mothers. Do you know, said Maggie Brunt, coming up to Charlotte at this moment, that Lizzie Parker is going to be adopted, a lady is going to adopt her. Oh, cried Charlotte breathlessly. 
an adoption was always a wonderful event in the asylum, as well as a somewhat rare one. Oh, how splendid! Yes, isn't it? said Maggie enviously. She picked out Lizzie because she was pretty and had curls. I didn't think it is fair. Charlotte sighed. Nobody will ever want to adopt me, because I've mousy hair and freckles, she said. But somebody may want you someday, Maggie. You have such lovely black hair. But it isn't curly, said Maggie forlornly. And the matron won't let me put it up in curl papers at night. I just wish I was Lizzie. Charlotte shook her head. I don't. I'd love to be adopted, but I wouldn't really like to be anybody but myself, even if I'm homely. It's better to be yourself with mousy hair and freckles than somebody else who is ever so beautiful. But I do envy Lizzie, though the matron says it is wicked to envy anyone. Envy of the fortunate Lizzie did not long possess Charlotte's mind, however, for that very day a wonderful thing happened at noon hour, by the northwest gap. Charlotte had always been very careful not to let the pretty lady see her. But today, after the pretty lady had gone past, Charlotte leaned out of the gap to watch her as far as she could. And just at that very moment, the pretty lady looked back, and there, peering at her from the asylum fence, was a little scrap of a girl, with mouse-colored hair and big freckles, and the sweetest, brightest, most winsome little face the pretty lady had ever seen. The pretty lady smiled right down at Charlotte and for just a moment her eyes looked as Charlotte had always known they ought to look. Charlotte was feeling rather frightened down in her heart, but she smiled bravely back. Are you thinking of running away? said the pretty lady, and, oh, what a sweet voice she had, sweet and tender, just like a mother's voice ought to be. No! said Charlotte, shaking her head gravely. I should like to run away, but it would be of no use, because there is no place to run to. Why would you like to run away? asked the pretty lady, still smiling. Don't you like living here? Charlotte opened her big eyes very widely. Why, it's an orphan asylum, she exclaimed, Nobody could like living in an orphan asylum. But of course, orphans should be very thankful to have any place to live in, and I am thankful. I'd be thankfuler still if the matron wouldn't make me take sulfur and molasses. If you had a little girl, would you make her take sulfur and molasses? I didn't when I had a little girl, said the pretty lady wistfully and her eyes were sad again. Oh, did you really have a little girl once? asked Charlotte softly. Yes, and she died, said the pretty lady in a trembling voice. Oh, I am sorry, said Charlotte, more softly still. Did she, did she have lovely golden hair and pink cheeks like yours? No, the pretty lady smiled again though it was a very sad smile. No, she had mouse-colored hair and freckles. Oh, and weren't you sorry? No, I was glad of it, because it made her look like a father. I've always loved little girls with mouse-colored hair and freckles ever since. Well, I must hurry along. I am late now, and schools have a dreadful habit of going in sharp on time. If you should happen to be here tomorrow, I'm going to stop and ask your name. Of course, Charlotte was at the Gap the next day, and they had a lovely talk. In a week, they were best of friends. 
Charlotte soon found out that she could make the pretty lady's eyes look as they ought to, for a little while at least. And she spent all her spare time, and lay awake at nights, devising speeches to make the pretty lady laugh. Then another wonderful thing happened. One evening, when Charlotte went to the southeast gap, the tall lady with the black eyes was not in the garden. At least, Charlotte thought she wasn't. But the very handsome cat was sitting gravely under a syringa bush and looking quite proud of himself for being a cat. You very handsome cat, said Charlotte. Won't you come here and let me stroke you? The very handsome cat did come, just as if he understood English, and he purred with delight when Charlotte took him in her arms and buried her face in his fur. Then Charlotte thought she would really sink into the ground, for the tall lady herself came around the lilac bush and stood before the gap. Please, ma'am, stammered Charlotte in an agony of embarrassment. I wasn't meaning to do any harm to your very handsome cat. I just wanted to pat him. I... I am very fond of cats, and they are not allowed in orphan asylums. I've always thought asylums weren't run on proper principles, said the tall lady briskly. Bless your heart, child. Don't look so scared. You're welcome to pat the cat all you like. Come in, and I'll give you some flowers. Uh, thank you, but I'm not allowed to go off the grounds, said Charlotte firmly. And I think I'd rather not have any flowers, because the matron might want to know where I got them and then she would have this gap closed up. I live in mortal dread for fear it will be closed anyhow. It's very uncomfortable living in mortal dread. The tall lady laughed a very jolly laugh. Yes, I should think it would be, she agreed. I haven't had that experience. Then they had a jolly talk, and every evening after that Charlotte went to the gap and stroked the very handsome cat, and chatted to the tall lady. Do you live all alone in that big house? she asked wonderingly one day. All alone, said the tall lady. Did you always live alone? No, I had a sister living with me once, but I don't want to talk about her. You'll oblige me, Charlotte, by not talking about her. I won't then, agreed Charlotte. I can understand why people don't like to have their sisters talked about sometimes. Lily Mitchell has a big sister who was sent to jail for stealing. Of course, Lily doesn't like to talk about her. The tall lady laughed a little bitterly. My sister didn't steal. She married a man I detested. That's all. Did he drink? asked Charlotte gravely. The matron's husband drank, and that is why she left him and took to running an orphan asylum. I think I'd rather put up with a drunken husband than live in an orphan asylum. My sister's husband didn't drink, said the tall lady grimly. He was beneath her. That was all. I told her I'd never forgive her, and I never shall. He's dead now. He died a year after she married him. And she's working for her living. I dare say she doesn't find it very pleasant. She wasn't brought up to that. Here, Charlotte, is a turnover for you. I made it on purpose for you. Eat it, and tell me if you don't think I'm a good cook. I'm dying for a compliment. I never get any now that I've got old. It's a dismal thing to get old, and have nobody to love you except a cat, Charlotte. I think it is just as bad to be young and have nobody to love you, not even a cat, sighed Charlotte, enjoying the turnover nevertheless. I dare say it is, agreed the tall lady, looking as if she had been struck by a new 
and rather startling idea. I liked the tall lady with the black eyes ever so much, thought Charlotte that night as she lay in bed. But I love the pretty lady. I have more fun with the tall lady and the very handsome cat, but I always feel nicer with the pretty lady. Oh, I'm so glad her little girl had mouse-colored hair. Then the most wonderful thing of all happened. One day, a week later, the pretty lady said, Would you like to come and live with me, Charlotte? Charlotte looked at her. Are you in earnest? she asked in a whisper. Indeed I am. I want you for my little girl, and if you'd like to come, you shall. I'm poor, Charlotte, really, I'm dreadfully poor, but I can make my salary stretch far enough for two, and we'll love each other enough to cover the thin spots. Will you come? Well, I should just think I will, said Charlotte emphatically. Oh, I wish I was sure I'm not dreaming. I do love you so much, and it will be so delightful to be your little girl. Very well, sweetheart. I'll come tomorrow afternoon. It is Saturday, so I'll have the whole blessed day off, and see the matron about it. Oh, we'll have lovely times together, dearest. I only wish I'd discovered you long ago. Charlotte may have eaten and studied and played and kept rules the rest of that day, and part of the next, but if so, she had no recollection of it. She went about like a girl in a dream, and the matron concluded that something more than sulfur and molasses was needed, and decided to speak to the doctor about her. But she never did, because a lady came that afternoon and told her she wanted to adopt Charlotte. A Charlotte obeyed the summons to the matron's room in a tingle of excitement. But when she went in, she saw only the matron and the tall lady with the black eyes. Before Charlotte could look around for the pretty lady, the matron said, Charlotte, this lady, Miss Herbert, wishes to adopt you. It is a splendid thing for you, and you ought to be a very thankful little girl. Charlotte's head fairly whirled. She clasped her hands, and the tears primped up in her eyes. Oh, I like the tall lady, she gasped, but I love the pretty lady, and I promised her I'd be her little girl. I can't break my promise. What on earth is the child talking about? said the mystified matron. And just then the maid showed in the pretty lady. Charlotte flew to her and flung her arms about her. Oh, tell them I'm your little girl, she begged. Tell them I promised you first. I don't want to hurt the tall lady's feelings, because I truly do like her so very much. But I want to be your little girl. The pretty lady had given one glance at the tall lady and flushed red. The tall lady, on the contrary, had grown very pale. The matron felt uncomfortable. Everybody knew that Miss Herbert and Mrs. Bond hadn't spoken to each other for years, even if they were sisters and alone in the world except for each other. Mrs. Bond turned to the matron. I have come to ask permission to adopt this little girl, she said. Oh, I'm very sorry, stammered the matron, but Miss Herbert has just asked for her and I have consented. Charlotte gave a great gulp of disappointment. But the pretty lady suddenly wheeled around to face the tall lady with quivering lips and tearful eyes. Don't take her from me, Alma, she pleaded humbly. She, she is so like my own baby, and I am so lonely. Any other child will suit you as well. 
Not at all, said the tall lady brusquely. Not at all, Anna. No other child will suit me at all. And may I ask what you intend to keep her on? I know your salary is barely enough for yourself. That is my concern, said the pretty lady a little proudly. Ha! Oh, the tall lady shrugged her shoulders. Just as independent as ever, Anna, I see. Well, child, what do you say? Which of us will you come with? Remember, I have the cat on my side, and Anna can't make half as good turnovers as I can. Remember all this, Charlotte. Oh, I... I like you so much, stammered Charlotte, and I wish I could live with you both. But since I can't, I must go with the pretty lady, because I promised and because I loved her first. And best? queried the tall lady. And best, admitted Charlotte. Bound to be truthful, even at the risk of hurting the tall lady's feelings. But I do like you too, next best. And you really don't need me as much as she does, for you have your very handsome cat, and she hasn't anything. A cat no longer satisfies the aching void in my soul, said the tall lady stubbornly. Nothing will satisfy it but a little girl with mouse-colored hair and freckles. No, Anna, I've got to have Charlotte. But I think that with her usual astuteness, she has already solved the problem for us by saying she'd like to live with us both. Why can't she? You just come back home and we'll let bygones be bygones. We both have something to forgive. But I was an obstinate old fool and I've known it for years, though I never confessed it to anybody but the cat. The pretty lady softened, trembled, smiled. She went right up to the tall lady and put her arms about her neck. Oh, I've wanted so much to be friends with you again, she sobbed. But I thought you would never relent, and, and, I've been so lonely. There, there, whispered the tall lady. Don't cry under the matron's eye. Wait till we get home. I may have some crying to do myself then. Charlotte, go and get your hat and come right over with us. We can sign the necessary papers later on. But we must have you right off. The cat is waiting for you on the back porch. And there is a turnover, cooling on the pantry window that is just your size. I am so happy, remarked Charlotte, that I feel like crying myself. Aunt Philippa and the Man I knew quite well why father sent me to Prince Edward Island to visit Aunt Philippa that summer. He told me he was sending me there to learn some sense. And my stepmother, of whom I was very fond, told me she was sure the sea air would do me a world of good. I did not want to learn sense or be done a world of good. I wanted to stay in Montreal and go on being foolish and make up my quarrel with Mark Fenwick. Father and mother did not know anything about this quarrel. They thought I was still on good terms with him, and that is why they sent me to Prince Edward Island. I was miserable. I did not want to go to Aunt Philippa's. It was not because I feared it would be dull, for without Mark, Montreal was just as much of a howling wilderness as any other place. But it was so horribly far away. When the time came for Mark to want to make up, as come I knew it would, how could he do it if I were seven hundred miles away? Nevertheless, I went to Prince Edward Island, 
In all my eighteen years, I had never once disobeyed Father. He is a very hard man to disobey. I knew I should have to make a beginning some time if I wanted to marry Mark. So I saved all my little courage up for that and didn't waste any of it opposing the visit to Aunt Philippa. I couldn't understand Father's point of view. Of course, he hated old John Fenwick, who had once sued him for libel and won the case. Father had written an indiscreet editorial in the excitement of a red-hot political contest, and was made to understand that there are some things you can't say of another man, even at election time. But then, he need not have hated Mark because of that. Mark was not even born when it happened. Old John Fenwick was not much better pleased about Mark and me than Father was. Though he didn't go to the length of forbidding it, he just acted crumpily and disagreeably. Things were unpleasant enough all around without a quarrel between Mark and me. Yet, quarrel we did. And over next to nothing too, you understand. And now I had to set out for Prince Edward Island, without even seeing him, for he was away in Toronto, on business. When my train reached Copley the next afternoon, Aunt Philippa was waiting for me. There was nobody else in sight, but I would have known her had there been a thousand. Nobody but Aunt Philippa could have that determined mouth, those piercing grey eyes, and that pronounced, unmistakable Goodwin nose. And certainly nobody but Aunt Philippa would have come to meet me arrayed in a wrapper of chocolate print, with huge yellow roses scattered over it, and a striped blue and white apron. She welcomed me kindly, but absent-mindedly, her thoughts evidently being concentrated on the problem of getting my trunk home. I had only the one, and in Montreal it had seemed to be of moderate size. But on the platform of Copley Station, sized up by Aunt Philippa's merciless eye, it certainly looked huge. I thought we could have took it along tied on the back of the buggy, she said disapprovingly. But I guess we'll have to leave it, and I'll send the hired boy over for it tonight. You can get along without it till then, I suppose. There was a fine irony in her tone. I hastened to assure her meekly that I could, and that it did not matter if my trunk could not be taken up till next day. Oh, Jerry can come for it tonight as well as not, said Aunt Philippa, as we climbed into her buggy. I had a good notion to send him to meet you, for he isn't doing much today, and I wanted to go to Mrs. Roderick McAllister's funeral. But my head was aching me so bad, I thought I wouldn't enjoy the funeral if I did go. My head is better now, so I kind of wish I had gone. She was a hundred and four years old, and I'd always promised myself that I'd go to her funeral. Aunt Philippa's tone was melancholy. She did not recover her good spirits until we were out on the pretty, grassy, elm-shaded country road, garlanded with its ribbon of buttercups. Then she suddenly turned around and looked me over scrutinizingly. You're not as good-looking as I expected from your picture, but them photographs always flatter, and that's the reason I never had any talk. You're rather thin and brown, but you've got good eyes, and you look clever. Your father writ me you hadn't much sense, though. He wants me to teach you some, but it's a thankless business. People would rather be fools. Aunt Philippa struck her steed smartly with the whip, and controlled his resultant friskiness with admirable skill. Well, you know it's pleasanter, I said wickedly. Just think what a doleful world it would be if everybody were sensible. Aunt Philippa looked at me out of the corner of her eye, 
and disdained any skirmish or flippant epigram. So you want to get married, she said. You'd better wait till you're grown up. How old must a person be before she is grown up? I asked gravely. Ha, oh, that depends. Some are grown up when they're born, and others ain't grown up when they're eighty. That same Mrs. Roderick I was speaking of never grew up. She was as foolish when she was a hundred as when she was ten. Perhaps that's why she lived so long, I suggested. All thought of seeking sympathy in Aunt Philippa had vanished. I resolved I would not even mention Mark's name. Maybe it was, admitted Aunt Philippa with a grim smile. I'd rather live fifty sensible years than a hundred foolish ones. Much to my relief, she made no further reference to my affairs. As we rounded a curve in the road, where two great overarching elms met, a buggy wheeled by us, occupied by a young man in clerical costume. He had a pleasant boyish face, and he touched his hat courteously. Aunt Philippa nodded very frostily, and gave a horse a quite undeserved cut. There's a man you don't want to have much to do with, she said potentiously. He's a Methodist minister. Why, Auntie, the Methodists are a very nice denomination, I protested. My stepmother is a Methodist, you know. No, I didn't know, but I'd believe anything of a stepmother. I've no use for Methodists or their ministers. This fellow just came last spring, and it's my opinion he smokes. And he thinks every girl who looks at him falls in love with him, as if a Methodist minister was any prize. Don't you take much notice of him, Ursula. I'll not be likely to have any chance, I said, with an amused smile. Oh, you'll see enough of him. He boards at Mrs. John Calman's just across the road from us, and he's always out sunning himself on the veranda. Never studies, of course. Last Sunday, they say, he preached on the iron that floated. If he'd confine himself to the Bible and leave sensational subjects alone, it would be better for him and his poor congregation. And so I told Mrs. John Calman to her face. I should think she would have had enough of his sex by this time. She married John Calman against her father's will. And he had delirious trembles for years. That's the man for you. They're not all like that, Aunt Philippa, I protested. Most of them are. See that house over there? Mrs. Jane Harrison lives there. Her husband took tantrums every few days or so and wouldn't get out of bed. She had to do all the barn work till he'd got over his spell. That's man for you. When he died, people writ her letters of condolence, but I just sat down and writ her one of congratulation. There's the Presbyterian man's in the hollow. Mr. Bantwell's our minister. He's a good man, and he'd be a rather nice one if he didn't think it was his duty to be a little miserable all the time. He won't let his wife wear a fashionable hat, and his daughter can't fix her hair the way she wants to. Even being a minister can't prevent a man from being a crank. Here's Ebenezer Milgrave coming. You take a good look at him. He used to be insane for years. He believed he was dead and used to rage at his wife because she wouldn't bury him. I'd have done it. Aunt Philippa looked so determinedly grim that I could almost see her with a spade in her hand. I laughed aloud at the picture summoned up. Yes, it's funny, but I guess his poor wife didn't find it very humorsome. He's been pretty sane for some years now, but you never can tell when he'll break out again. He's got a brother, Albert Milgrave, who's been married twice. 
They say he was courting his second wife while his first was dying. Let that be as it may. He used his first wife's wedding ring to marry the second. That's the man for you. Don't you know any good husbands, Aunt Philippa? I asked desperately. Oh, yes, lots of them. Over there, said Aunt Philippa sardonically, waving her whip in the direction of a little country graveyard on a distant hill. Yes, but living, walking about in the flesh. Precious few. Now and again you'll come across a man whose wife won't put up with any nonsense, and he has to be respectable. But the most of them are poor bargains. Poor bargains. And are all wives saints? I persisted. Laws, no. But they're too good for the man, retorted Aunt Philippa, as she turned in at her own gate. Her house was close to the road, and was painted such a vivid green that the landscape looked faded by contrast. Across the gable end of it was the legend Philippa's Farm, emblazoned in huge black letters two feet long. All its surroundings were very neat. On the kitchen doorstep, a patchwork cat was making a grave toilet. The groundwork of the cat was white, and its spots were black, yellow, grey, and brown. There's Joseph, said Aunt Philippa. I call him that because his coat is of many colours. But there ain't no lover of cats. They're too much like the men to suit me. Cats have always been supposed to be peculiarly feminine, I said, descending. T'was a man that supposed it, then, retorted Aunt Philippa, beckoning to her hired boy. Here, Jerry, put Prince away. Jerry's a good sort of boy, she confided to me as we went into the house. I had Jim Spencer last summer, and the only good thing about him was his appetite. I put up with him till harvest was in, and then one day my patience give out. He upset a churn full of cream in the back yard, and was just as cool as a cow compo of it, laughed and said it was good for the land. I told him I wasn't in the habit of fertilizing my back yard with cream. But that's the man for you. Come in. I'll have tea ready in no time. I sought the table before I left. There's lemon pie. Mrs. John Cantwell sent it over. I never make lemon pie myself. Ten years ago, I took the prize for lemon pies at the county fair. And I've never made any since, for fear I'd lose my reputation for them. And the first month of my stay passed not unpleasantly. The summer weather was delightful, and the sea air was certainly splendid. Aunt Philippa's little farm ran right down to the shore, and I spent much of my time there. There were also several families of cousins to be visited in the farmhouses that dotted the pretty, seaward-sloping valley. And they came back to see me at Philippa's farm. I picked spruce gum and berries and ferns, and Aunt Philippa taught me to make butter. It was all very idyllic, or would have been if Mark had written, but Mark did not write. I suppose he must be very angry, because I had run off to Prince Edward Island without so much as a note of goodbye, but I had been so sure he would understand. Aunt Philippa never made any further reference to the reason father had sent me to her. But she allowed no day to pass without holding up to me some horrible example of matrimonial infelicity. The number of unhappy wives who walked or drove past Philippa's farm every afternoon as we sat on the veranda was truly pitiable. We always sat on the veranda in the afternoon, when we were not visiting or being visited. I made a pretense of fancy work 
and Don Philippa spun diligently on a little old-fashioned spinning wheel that had been her grandmother's. She always sat before the wood stand which held her flowers, and the gorgeous blots of geranium blossom and big green leaves furnished a pretty background. She always wore her shapeless but clean print wrappers, and her iron-gray hair was always combed neatly down over her ears. Joseph sat between us, sleeping or purring. She spun so expertly that she could keep a close watch on the road as well, and I got the biography of every individual who went by. So for the poor young Methodist minister, who liked to read or walk on the veranda of our neighbor's house, Aunt Philippa never had a good word for him. I had met him once or twice socially and had liked him, I wanted to ask him to call, but dared not. Aunt Philippa had vowed he should never enter her house. If I was dead and he came to my funeral, I'd rise up and order him out, she said. I thought he made a very nice prayer at Mrs. Seaman's funeral the other day, I said. Oh, I have no doubt he can pray. I never heard anyone make more beautiful prayers than old Simon Kennedy down at the harbor, who was always drunk or hoping to be, and the drunker he was, the better he prayed. It ain't no matter how well a man prays if his preaching isn't right. That Methodist man preaches a lot of things that ain't true, and what's worse, they ain't sound doctrine. At least, that's what I've heard. I never was in a Methodist church. Thank goodness. Don't you think Methodists go to heaven as well as Presbyterians, Aunt Philippa? I asked gravely. That ain't for us to decide, said Aunt Philippa solemnly. It's in higher hands than ours. But I ain't going to associate with them on earth, whatever I may have to do in heaven. The folks around here mostly don't make much difference and go to the Methodist church quite often. But I say, if you're a Presbyterian, be a Presbyterian. Of course, if you ain't, it don't matter much what you do. As for that minister man, he has a grand uncle who was sent to the penitentiary for embezzlement. I found out that much. And evidently, Aunt Philippa had taken an unholy joy in finding it out. I dare say some of our own ancestors deserved to go to the penitentiary, even if they never did. I remarked. Who is that woman driving past, Aunt Philippa? She must have been very pretty once. She was, and that was all the good it did her. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain, Ursula. She was Sarah Pyatt, and she married Fred Proctor. He was one of our wicked, fascinating men. After she married him, he gave up being fascinating, but he kept on being wicked. That's the man for you. Her sister Flora weren't much luckier. Her man was that domineering she couldn't call her soul her own. Finally, he couldn't get his own way over something, and he just suicided by jumping into the well. A good riddance. But of course, the well was spoiled. Flora could never abide the thought of using it again, poor thing. That's man for you. And there's that old Enoch Allen on his way to the station. He's ninety if he's a day. You can't kill some folks with a meat axe. His wife died twenty years ago. He'd been married when he was twenty, so they lived together for fifty years. She was a faithful, hard-working creature, and kept him out of the poorhouse, for he was a shiftless soul, not lazy, exactly, but just too fond of sitting. But he weren't grateful. She had a kind of bitter tongue, and they did use to fight scandalous. Of course, it was all his fault. Well, she died, 
and old Enoch and my father drove together to the graveyard. Old Enoch was awful quiet all the way there and back. But just before they got home, he says solemnly to father, You mayn't believe it, Henry, but this is the happiest day of my life. That's man for you. His brother, Scotty Allen, was the meanest man ever lived in these parts. When his wife died, she was buried with a little gold brooch in her collar, unbeknownst to him. When he found it out, he went one night to the graveyard and opened up the grave and the casket to get that brooch. Oh, Aunt Philippa, that's a horrible story, I cried, recoiling with a shiver over the gruesomeness of it. Of course it is, but what would you expect of a man? retorted Aunt Philippa. Somehow, her stories began to affect me, in spite of myself. And there were times when I felt very dreary. Perhaps Aunt Philippa was right. Perhaps man possessed neither truth nor constancy. Certainly, Mark had forgotten me. I was ashamed of myself, because this hurt me so much. But I could not help it. I grew pale and listless. Aunt Philippa sometimes peered at me sharply, but she held her peace. I was grateful for this. But one day a letter did come from Mark. I dared not to read it until I was safely in my room. Then I opened it with trembling fingers. The letter was a little stiff. Evidently Mark was feeling sore enough over things. He made no reference to our quarrel, or to my sojourn in Prince Edward Island. He wrote that his firm was sending him to South Africa to take charge of their interests there. He would leave in three weeks' time and could not return for five years. If I still cared anything for him, would I meet him in Halifax, marry him, and go to South Africa with him? If I would not, he would understand that I had ceased to love him, and that all was over between us. That, boiled down, was the gist of Mark's letter. When I had read it, I cast myself on the bed and wept out all the tears I had refused to let myself shed during my weeks of exile. For I could not do what Mark asked. I could not. I couldn't run away to be married in that desolate, unbefriended fashion. I would be a disgrace. I would feel ashamed of it all my life and be unhappy over it. I thought that Mark was rather unreasonable. He knew what my feelings about runaway marriages were. And was it absolutely necessary for him to go to South Africa? Of course, his father was behind it somewhere. But surely he could have got out of it if he had really tried. Well, if he went to South Africa, he must go alone. But my heart would break. I cried the whole afternoon, cowered among my pillows. I never wanted to go out of that room again. I never wanted to see anybody again. I hated the thought of facing Aunt Philippa with her cold eyes and her miserable stories that seemed to strip life of all beauty and love of all reality. I could hear her scornful, that's the man for you, if she heard what was in Mark's letter. What is the matter, Ursula? Aunt Philippa was standing by my bed. I was too abject to resent her coming in without knocking. Nothing, I said spiritlessly. If you've been crying for three mortal hours over nothing, you want a good spanking, and you'll get it, observed Aunt Philippa placidly, sitting down on my trunk. Get right up off that bed this minute and tell me what the trouble is. I'm bound to know, for I am in your father's place at present. There, then, I flung her Mark's letter. 
There wasn't anything in it that it was sacrilege to let another person see. That was one reason why I had been crying. Aunt Philippa read it over twice. Then she folded it up deliberately and put it back in the envelope. What are you going to do? she asked in a matter-of-fact tone. I'm not going to run away to be married, I answered sullenly. Well, no, I wouldn't advise you to, said Aunt Philippa reflectively. It's a kind of low-down thing to do, though there's been a terrible lot of romantic nonsense talked and writ about eloping. It may be a painful necessity sometimes, but it ain't in this case. You write to your young man and tell him to come here and be married respectable under my roof, same as a good man ought to. I sat up and stared at Aunt Philippa. I was so amazed that it is useless to try to express my amazement. Aunt Philippa, I gasped. I thought, I thought... You thought I was a hard old customer, and so I am, said Aunt Philippa. But I don't take my opinions from your father, nor anybody else. It didn't prejudice me any against your young man that your father didn't like him. I knew your father of old. I have some other friends in Montreal, and I writ to them and asked them what he was like. From what they said, I judged he was decent enough as a man go. You're too young to be married, but if you let him go off to South Africa, he'll slip through your fingers for sure. And I suppose you're like some of the rest of us. Nobody'll do you but the one. So tell him to come here and be married. I don't see how I can, I gasped. I can't get ready to be married in three weeks. I can't. I should think you have enough clothes in that trunk to do you for a spell, said Aunt Philippa sarcastically. You've more than my mother ever had in all her life. We'll get you a wedding dress of some kind. You can get it made in Charlottetown, if country dressmakers aren't good enough for you. And I'll bake you a wedding cake that'll taste as good as anything you could get in Montreal, even if it won't look so stylish. What will father say? I questioned. Lots of things, conceded Aunt Philippa grandly. But I don't see as it matters, when neither you nor me will be there to have our feelings hurt. I'll write a few things to your father. He hasn't got much sense. He ought to be thankful to get a decent young man for his son-in-law, in a world where most every man is a wolf in sheep's clothing. But that's the man for you. And that was Aunt Philippa for you. For the next three weeks... She was a blissfully excited, busy woman. I was allowed to choose the material and fashion of my wedding suit and hat myself. But almost everything else was settled by Aunt Philippa. I didn't mind. It was a relief to be rid of all responsibility. I did protest when she declared her intention of having a big wedding and asking all the cousins and semi-cousins on the island. But Aunt Philippa swept my objections lightly aside. I'm bound to have one good wedding in this house, she said. Not likely I'll ever have another chance. She found time amid all the baking and concocting to warn me frequently not to take it too much to heart if Mark failed to come after all. I know a man who jilted a girl on her wedding day. That's the man for you. It's best to be prepared. But Mark did come, getting there the evening before her wedding day. And then a severe blow fell on Aunt Philippa. Word came from the manse that Mr. Bentwell had been suddenly summoned to Nova Scotia, to his mother's deathbed he had started that night. That's the man for you, said Aunt Philippa bitterly. Never can depend on one of them. Not even on a minister. What's to be done now? 
Get another minister, said Mark easily. Where'll you get him? demanded Aunt Philippa. The minister at Cliftonville is away on his vacation, and Mercer is vacant, and that leaves none nearer than town. It won't do to depend on a town minister being able to come. No, there's no help for it. You'll have to have that Methodist man. Aunt Philippa's tone was tragic. Plainly, she thought the ceremony would scarcely be legal if that Methodist man married us. But neither Mark nor I cared. We were too happy to be disturbed by any such trifles. The young Methodist minister married us the next day in the presence of many beaming guests. Aunt Philippa, splendid in black silk and point lace collar, neither of which lost a whit of dignity or luster by being made ten years before, was composure itself while the ceremony was going on. But no sooner had the minister pronounced us man and wife than she spoke up. Now that's over, I want someone to go right out and put out the fire on the kitchen roof. It's been on fire for the last ten minutes. Ministers and bridegroom headed to the emergency brigade, and Aunt Philippa pumped the water for them. In a short time, the fire was out. All was safe, and we were receiving our deferred congratulations. Now, young man, said Aunt Philippa solemnly as she shook hands with Mark. Don't you ever try to get out of this, even if a Methodist minister did marry you. She insisted on driving us to the train, and said goodbye to us as we stood on the car steps. She had caught more of the shower of rice than I had, and as the day was hot and sunny, she had tied over her head, atop of that festal silk dress, a huge homemade untrimmed straw hat. But she did not look ridiculous. There was a certain dignity about Aunt Philippa in any costume and under any circumstance. Aunt Philippa, I said, tell me this. Why have you helped me to be married? The train began to move. I refused once to run away myself, and I've repented it ever since. Then, as the train gathered speed and the distance between us widened, she shouted after us. But I suppose if I had run away, I'd have repented of that too. My Lady Jane The boat got into Broughton half an hour after the train had gone. We had been delayed by some small accident to the machinery, hence that lost half an hour, which meant a night's sojourn for me in Broughton. I am ashamed of the things I thought and said. When I think that fate might have taken me at my word and raised up a special train, or some such miracle, by which I might have got away from Broughton that night, I experience a cold chill. Out of gratitude, I have never sworn over missing connections since. At the time, however, I felt thoroughly exasperated. I was in a hurry to get on. Important business engagements would be unhinged by the delay. I was a stranger in Broughton. It looked like a stupid, stuffy little town. I went to a hotel in an atrocious humor. After I had fumed until I wanted a change, it occurred to me that I might as well hunt up Clark Oliver by way of passing the time. I had never been overly fond of Clark Oliver. Although he was my cousin, he was a bit of a cat, and stupider than anyone belonging to our family had a right to be. Moreover, he was in politics, and I detest politics. But I rather wanted to see if he looked as much like me as he used to. 
I hadn't seen him for three years, and I hoped that the time might have differentiated us to a saving degree. It was over a year since I had last been blown up by some unknown, excited individual on the ground. That I was that scoundrel Oliver, politically speaking. I thought that was a good omen. I went to Clark's office, found he had left, and followed him to his rooms. The minute I saw him, I experienced the same nasty feeling of lost or bewildered individuality, which always overcame me in his presence. He was so absurdly like me. I felt as if I were looking into a mirror where my reflection persisted in doing things I didn't do, thereby producing a most uncanny sensation. Clark pretended he was glad to see me. He really couldn't have been, because his great idea hadn't struck him then, and we had always disliked each other. Hello, Elliot, he said, shaking me by the hand with a twist he had learned in election campaigns, whereby something like hardiness was simulated. Glad to see you, old fellow. Gad, you're as like me as ever. Where did you drop from? I explained my predicament, and we talked amiably and harmlessly for a while about family gossip. I abhor family gossip, but it is a shade better than politics. And those two subjects are the only ones on which Clark can converse at all. I described Mary Alice's wedding, and Florence's new young man, and Tom and Kate's twins. Clark tried to be interested, but I saw he had something on what serves him for a mind. After a while, it came out. He looked at his watch with a frown. I'm in a bit of a puzzle, he said. The Mark Kennedys are giving a dinner tonight. You don't know them, of course. They are the big people of Broughton. Kennedy runs the politics of the place, and Mrs. K makes or mars people socially. It's my first invitation there, and it's necessary I should accept it. Necessary every way. Mrs. K would never forgive me if I disappointed her at the last moment. Not that I, personally, am of much account yet to her. But it would leave a vacant place. Mrs. K would never notice me again, and, as she bosses Kennedy, I can't afford to offend her. Besides, there's a girl who'll be there. I've met her once. I want to meet her again. She's a beauty, and no mistake. Top lofty as they make him, though. However, I think I've made an impression on her. It was at the Harvey stands last week. She was the handsomest woman there, and she never took her eyes off me. I've given Mrs. Kennedy a pretty broad hint that I want to take her in to dinner. If I don't go, I'll miss all round. Well, what is there to prevent you from going? I asked squiffly. I never could endure the way Clark talked about girls and hinted at his conquests. Just this. Herbert Bronson came to town this afternoon and is leaving on the 10.30 train tonight. He sent me word to meet him at his hotel this evening and talk over a mining deal I've been trying to pull off. I simply must go. It's my one chance to corral Bronson. If I lose him, it'll be all up, and I'll be thousands out of pocket. Well, you are in rather a predicament, I agreed, with the philosophical acceptance of the situation that marks the outsider. I wasn't hampered by the multiplicity of my business and social engagements that evening. So, I could afford to pity Clark. 
It is always rather nice to be able to pity a person you dislike. I should say so. I can't make up my mind what to do. Hang it. I'll have to see Bronson. There's no question about that. A man ought to keep an understood substitute on hand to send to dinners when he can't go. By Joe, Elliot. Clark's great idea had arrived. He bounced up eagerly. Elliot, will you go to the Kennedys in my place? They'll never know the difference. Do now, there's a good fellow. Nonsense, I said. It isn't nonsense. The resemblance between us was foreordained for this hour. I'll lend you my dress suit. It'll fit you. Your figure is as much like mine as your face. You've nothing to do with yourself this evening. I offer you a good dinner and an agreeable partner. Come now, do oblige me. You know you owe me a good turn for that Malhinen business. The Malhinen business clinched the matter. Until he mentioned it, I had no notion whatever of masquerading as Clark Oliver at the Kennedy's dinner. But, as Clark so delicately put it, he had done me a good turn in that affair, and the obligation had rankled ever since. It is beastly to be indebted for a favor to a man you detest. Now was my chance to pay it off, and I took it without more ado. But, I said doubtfully, I don't know the Kennedys, nor any of the social stunts that are doing in Broughton. I won't dare to talk about anything, and I'll seem so stupid, even if I don't actually make some irremediable blunder, that the Kennedys will be disgusted with you. It will probably do your prospects more harm than your absence would. Not at all. Keep your mouth shut when you can, and talk generalities when you can't. And you'll pass. If you take that girl in, she's a stranger in Praten, and won't suspect your ignorance of what's going on. Nobody will suspect you. Nobody here knows I have a cousin so like me. Our own mothers haven't always been able to tell us apart. Our very voices are alike. Come now. Get into my dinner talks. You haven't much time, and Mrs. K doesn't like late comers. There seemed to be a number of things that Mrs. Kennedy did not like. I thought my chance of pleasing that critical lady extremely small, especially when I had to live up to Clark Oliver's personality. However, I dressed as expeditiously as possible. The novelty of the adventure rather pleased me. I always liked doing unusual things. Anything was better than lounging away the evening at my hotel. It couldn't do any harm. I owed Clark Oliver a good turn, and I would save Mrs. Kennedy the annoyance of a vacant chair. There was no disputing the fact that I looked most disgustingly like Clark when I got into his clothes. I actually felt a grudge against them for their excellent fit. You'll do, said Clark. Remember you're conservative tonight and don't let your rank liberal views crop out. Or you'll queer me for all time with the great and only Mark. He doesn't talk politics at his dinners, though, so you're not likely to have trouble on that score. Mrs. Kennedy has a weakness for beer mugs. Her collection is considered very fine. The scandal whispers that Miss Harvey has a budding interest in settlement work. Miss who? I said sharply. Harvey, Christian name unknown. That's the girl I mentioned. You'll probably take her in. Be nice to her, even if you have to make an effort. She's the one I've picked out as your future cousin, you know, so I don't want you to spoil her good opinion of me in any way. The name had given me a jump. Once, in another world, 
I had known a Jane Harvey. But Clark's Miss Harvey couldn't be Jane. A month before, I had read a newspaper item to the effect that Jane was on the Pacific coast. Moreover, Jane, when I knew her, had certainly no manifest vocation for settlement work. I didn't think two years could have worked such a transformation. Two years? Was it only two years? It seemed more like two centuries. I went to the Kennedys in a pleasantly excited frame of mind and a cab. I just missed being laid by a hairbreath. The house was a big one, and everybody pertaining to it was big, except the host. Mark Kennedy was a little, thin man with a bald head. He didn't look like a political power, but that was all the more reason for his being one in a world where things are not what they seem. Mrs. Kennedy greeted me cordially and told me significantly that she had granted my request. This meant, as my card had already informed me, that I was to take Miss Harvey out. Of course, there would be no introduction, since Clark Oliver was already acquainted with the lady. I was wondering how I was to locate her when I got a shock that made me dizzy. Jane was over in a corner looking at me. There was no time to collect my wits. The guests were moving out to the dining room. I took my nerve in my hand, crossed the room, bowed, and the next moment was walking through the hall with Jane's hand on my arm. The hall was a good long one. I blessed the architect who had planned it. It gave me time to sort out my ideas. Jane, here. Jane going out to dinner with me, believing me to be Clark Oliver. Jane, but it was incredible. The whole thing was a dream. Or had I gone crazy? I looked at her sideways when we had got into our places at the table. She was more beautiful than ever. That tall, brown-haired, disdainful Jane. The settlement work story I was inclined to dismiss as a myth. Settlement work in a beautiful woman generally means crow's feet or a broken heart. Jane, according to my sight and belief, possessed neither. Once upon a time, I had been engaged to Jane. I had been idiotically in love with her in those days, and still more idiotically believed that she loved me. The trouble was that, although I had been cured of the latter phase of my idiocy, the former had become chronic. I had never been able to get over loving Jane. All through those two years, I had hugged the fond hope that sometimes I might stumble across her in a mild mood and make matters up. There was no such thing as seeking her out or writing to her, since she had icily forbidden me to do so, and Jane had a most detestable habit, in a woman, of meaning what she said. But the deity I had invoked was the god of chance, and this was how he had answered my prayers. I was eating my dinner beside Jane, who supposed me to be Clark Oliver. What should I do? Confess the truth and plead my cause while she had to sit beside me? That would never do. Someone might overhear us, and in any case, it would be no passport to Jane's favor that I was a guest in the house under false pretenses. She would be certain to disapprove strongly. It was a maddening situation. Jane, who was calmly eating soup, she was the only woman I had ever seen who could eat soup and look like a goddess at the same time, glanced around and caught me studying her profile. 
I thought she blushed slightly, and I reached inwardly to think that blush was meant for Clark Oliver. Clark Oliver, who had told me he thought Jane was smitten on him. Jane, on him. Do you know, Mr. Oliver, said Jane slowly, that you are startling like a... a person I used to know. When I first saw you the other night, I took you for him. A person you used to know. Oh, Jane, that was the most unkindest cut of all. My cousin, Elliot Cameron, I suppose, I answered as indifferently as I could. We resemble each other very closely. You were acquainted with Cameron, Miss Harvey? Slightly, said Jane. A fine fellow, I said unblushingly. Uh-huh, said Jane. My favorite relative, I went on brazenly. He's a thoroughly good sort. Rather dull now to what he used to be, though. He had an unfortunate love affair two years ago and has never got over it. Indeed, said Jane coldly, crumbling a bit of bread between her fingers. Her face was expressionless and her voice ditto. But I had heard her criticize nervous people who did things like that at the table. I fear poor Elliot's life has been completely spoiled, I said with a sigh. It's a shame. Did he confide the affair to you? asked Jane a little scornfully. Well, after a fashion, he said enough for me to guess the rest. He never told me the lady's name. She was very beautiful, I understand, and very heartless. Oh, she used him very badly. Did he tell you that too? asked Jane. Not he. He won't listen to a word against her. But a chap can draw his own conclusions, you know? What went wrong between them? asked Jane. She smiled at the lady across the table, as if she were merely asking questions to make conversation. But she went on crumbling bread. Simply a very stiff quarrel, I believe. Elliot never went into details. The lady was flirting with somebody else, I fancy. People have such different ideas about flirting, said Jane languidly. What one would call mere simple friendliness, another construes into flirting. Possibly your friend, or is it your cousin, is one of those men who become insanely jealous over every trifle and attempt to exert authority before they have any to exert. A woman of spirit would hardly fail to resent that. Of course, Elliot was jealous, I admitted. But then, you know, Miss Harvey, that jealousy is said to be the measure of a man's love. If he went beyond his rights, I am sure he's bitterly sorry for it. Does he really care about her still? asked Jane, eating most industriously, although, somehow, the contents of her plate did not grow noticeably less. As for me, I didn't pretend to eat. I simply packed. He loves her with all his heart, I answered fervently. There never has been, and never will be, any other woman for Elliot Cameron. Why doesn't he go and tell her so? inquired Jane, as if she felt rather bored over the whole subject. He doesn't dare to. She forbade him ever to cross her path again, told him she hated him, and always would hate him as long as she lived. She must have been an unpleasantly emphatic young woman, commented Jane. I'd like to hear anyone say so to Elliot, I responded. He considers her perfection, I am sorry for Elliot. His life is wrecked. Do you know, said Jane slowly, as if poking about in the recesses of her memory, or something half forgotten, 
I believe I know the, uh, the girl in question. Really? I said. Yes, she is a friend of mine. She, she never told me his name, but putting two and two together, I believe it must have been your cousin, but she, she thinks she was the one to blame. Does she? It was my turn to ask questions now, but my heart thumped so that I could hardly speak. Yes, she says she was too hasty and unreasonable. She didn't mean to flirt at all and she never cared for anyone but him. But his jealousy irritated her. I suppose she said things to him she didn't really mean. She, she never supposed he was going to take her at her word. Do you think she cares for him still, considering what was at stake? I think I asked the question very well. I think she must, said Jane languidly. She has never looked at any other man. She devotes most of her time to charitable work, but I feel sure she isn't really happy. So, the settlement story was true. Oh, Jane. What would you advise my cousin to do? I asked. Do you think he should go boldly to her? Would she listen to him? forgive him. She might, said Jane. Have I your permission to tell Elliot Cameron this? I demanded. Jane selected and ate an olive with maddening deliberation. I suppose you may, if you are really convinced that he wants to hear it, she said at last, as if barely recollecting that I had asked the question two minutes previously. I'll tell him as soon as I go home, I said. I had the satisfaction of startling Jane at last. She turned her head and looked at me. I got a good, square, satisfying gaze into her big, blackish-blue eyes. Yes, I said, compelling myself to look away. He came in on the boat this afternoon, too late for his train has to stay over till tomorrow night. I left him in my rooms when I came away. Doubtless tomorrow we'll see him speeding recklessly to his dear divinity. I wonder if he knows where she is at present. If he doesn't, said Jane, with the air of dismissing the subject once and forever from her mind, I can give him the information. You may tell him I am staying with the Duncan Moors, and shall be leaving day after tomorrow. By the way, have you seen Mrs. Kennedy's collection of steins? It is a remarkably fine one. Clark Oliver couldn't come to our wedding. Or wouldn't. Jane has never met him since, but she cannot understand why I have such an aversion to him especially when he has such a good opinion of me. She says she thought him charming, and one of the most interesting conversationalists she ever went out to dinner with. The Man on the Train When the telegram came from William George, Grandma Sheldon was all alone with Cyrus and Louise. And Cyrus and Louise, aged respectively twelve and eleven, were not very much good, Grandma thought, when it came to advising what was to be done. Grandma was all in a flutter, dear, oh dear, as she said. The telegram said that Delia, William George's wife, was seriously ill down at Green Village, and William George wanted Samuel to bring Grandma down immediately. Delia had always thought there was nobody like Grandma when it came to nursing sick folks. But Samuel and his wife were both away, had been away for two days, 
and intended to be away for five more. They had driven to Sinclair, twenty miles away, to visit with Mrs. Samuel's folks for a week. Dear, oh dear, what shall I do? said Grandma. Go right to Green Village on the evening train, said Cyrus briskly. Dear, oh dear, and leave you two alone, cried Grandma. Louise and I will do very well until tomorrow, said Cyrus sturdily. We will send word to Sinclair by today's mail, and father and mother will be home by tomorrow night. But I never was on the cars in my life, protested Grandma nervously. I'm, I'm so frightened to start alone, and you never know what kind of people you may meet on the train. You'll be all right, Grandma. I'll drive you to the station, get your ticket, and put you on the train. Then you'll have nothing to do until the train gets to Green Village. I'll send a telegram to Uncle William George to meet you. I shall fall and break my neck getting off the train, said Grandma pessimistically. But she was wondering at the same time whether she had better take the black valise or the yellow, and whether William George would be likely to have plenty of flaxseed in the house. It was six miles to the station, and Cyrus drove Grandma over in time to catch the train that reached Green Village at nine o'clock. Dear, oh dear, said Grandma, what if William George's folks ain't there to meet me? It's all very well, Cyrus, to say that they will be there, but you don't know. And it's all very well to say not to be nervous because everything will be all right if you were seventy-five years old and had never set foot on the cars in your life, you'd be nervous too. And you can't be sure that everything will be all right. You never know what sort of people you'll meet on the train. I may get on the wrong train, or lose my ticket, or get carried past Green Village, or get my pocket picked. Well, no, I won't do that, for not one cent will I carry with me. You shall take back home all the money you don't need to get my ticket. Then I shall be easier in my mind. Dear, oh dear. If it wasn't that Delilah is so seriously ill, I wouldn't go one step. Oh, you'll be all right, Grandma, assured Cyrus. He got Grandma's ticket for her, and Grandma tied it up in the corner of her handkerchief. Then the train came in, and Grandma, clinging closely to Cyrus, was put on it. Cyrus found a comfortable seat for her and shook hands cheerily. Goodbye, Grandma. Don't be frightened. Here's the weekly Argus. I got it at the store. You may like to look over it. Then Cyrus was gone, and in a minute the station house and platform began to glide away. Dear, oh dear, what has happened to it? thought Grandma in dismay. The next moment she exclaimed aloud, Why, it's us that's moving, not it. Some of the passengers smiled pleasantly at Grandma. She was the variety of old lady at which people do smile pleasantly. A grandma with round pink cheeks, soft brown eyes, and lovely snow-white curls is a nice person to look at, wherever she is found. After a while, Grandma, to her amazement, discovered that she liked riding on the cars. It was not at all the disagreeable experience she had expected it to be. Why, she was just as comfortable as if she were in her own rocking chair at home. And there were such a lot of people to look at, and many of the ladies had such beautiful dresses and hats. After all, the people you met on a train thought Grandma, are surprisingly like the people you meet off it. If it had not been for wondering how she would get off at Green Village, Grandma would have enjoyed herself thoroughly. 
Four or five stations farther, and the train halted at a lonely-looking place consisting of the station house and a barn, surrounded by shrub woods and blueberry barrens. One passenger got on, and, finding only one vacant seat in the crowded car, sat right down beside Grandma Sheldon. Grandma Sheldon held her breath while she looked him over. Was he a pickpocket? He didn't appear like one, but you can never be sure of the people you meet on the train. Grandma remembered with a sigh of thankfulness that she had no money. Besides, he seemed really very respectable and harmless. He was quietly dressed in a suit of dark blue serge with a black overcoat. He wore his hat well down on his forehead and was clean-shaven. His hair was very black, but his eyes were blue. Nice eyes, Grandma thought. She always felt great confidence in a man who had bright, open blue eyes. Grandpa Sheldon, who had died so long ago, four years after the marriage, had had bright blue eyes. To be sure, he had fair hair, reflected Grandma. It's really odd to see such black hair with such light blue eyes. Well, he's really nice looking, and I don't believe there's a mite of harm in him. The early autumn night had now fallen, and Grandma could not amuse herself by watching the scenery. She bethought herself of the paper Cyrus had given her, and took it out of her basket. It was an old weekly a fortnight back. On the first page was a long account of a murder case with scare heads, and into this Grandma plunged eagerly. Sweet old Grandma Sheldon, who would not have harmed a fly, and hated to see even a mousetrap set, simply reveled in the newspaper accounts of murders. And the more shocking and cold-blooded they were, the more eagerly did Grandma read of them. This murder story was particularly good from Grandma's point of view. It was full of thrills. A man had been shot down, apparently in cold blood, and his supposed murderer was still at large and had eluded all the efforts of justice to capture him. His name was Mark Hartwell, and he was described as a tall, fair man with full auburn beard and curly, light hair. What a shocking thing, said Grandma aloud. Her companion looked at her with a kindly, amused smile. What is it? he asked. Why, this murder at Charlottesville, answered Grandma, forgetting, in her excitement, that it was not safe to talk to people you met on the train. It just makes my blood run cold to read about it, and to think that the man who did this is still around the country somewhere, plotting other murders, I have no doubt. What is the good of the police? They are dull fellows, agreed the dark man. But I don't envy that man his conscience, said Grandma solemnly, and somewhat inconsistently in view of a statement about the other murders that were being plotted. What must a man feel like who has the blood of a fellow creature on his hands? Depend upon it, his punishment has begun already, caught or not. That is true, said the dark man quietly. Such a good-looking man, too said Grandma, looking wistfully at the murderer's picture. It doesn't seem possible that he can have killed anybody, but the paper says there isn't a doubt. He is probably guilty, said the dark man, but nothing is known of his provocation. The affair may not have been so cold-blooded as the accounts state. Those newspaper fellows never err on the side of undercoloring. I really think, said Grandma slowly, that I would like to see a murderer, just one, whenever I say anything like that 
Adelaide, Adelaide is Samuel's wife, looks at me as if she thought there was something wrong about me. And perhaps there is, but I do, all the same. When I was a little girl, there was a man in our settlement who was suspected of poisoning his wife. She died very suddenly. I used to look at him with such interest, but it wasn't satisfactory, because you could never be sure whether he was really guilty or not. I never could believe that he was, because he was such a nice man in some ways, and so good and kind to children. I don't believe a man who was bad enough to poison his wife could have any good in him. Perhaps not, agreed the dark man. He had absent-mindedly folded up Grandma's old copy of the Argus and put it in his pocket. Grandma did not like to ask him for it, although she would have liked to see if there were any more murder stories in it. Besides, just at that moment, the conductor came around for tickets. Grandma looked in the basket for her handkerchief. It was not there. She looked on the floor and on the seat and under the seat. It was not there. She stood up and shook herself. Still no handkerchief. Dear, oh dear, exclaimed Grandma wildly. I've lost my ticket. I always knew I would. I told Cyrus I would. Oh, where can it be? The conductor scowled unsympathetically. The dark man got up and helped Grandma search, but no ticket was to be found. You'll have to pay the money then, and something extra, said the conductor gruffly. I can't. I haven't a cent of money, wailed Grandma. I gave it all to Cyrus, because I was afraid my pocket would be pecked. Oh, what shall I do? Don't worry, I'll make it all right, said the dark man. He took out his pocketbook and handed the conductor a bill. That functionary grumblingly made the change and marched onward, while Grandma, pale with excitement and relief, sank back into her seat. I can't tell you how much I am obliged to you, sir, she said tremulously. I don't know what I should have done. Would he have put me off right here in the snow? I hardly think he would have gone to such lengths, said the dark man with a smile. But he's a cranky, disobliging fellow enough. I know him of old, and you must not feel overly grateful to me. I am glad of the opportunity to help you. I had an old grandmother myself once, he added with a sigh. You must give me your name and address, of course, said Grandma, and my son, Samuel Sheldon of Midvern, will see that the money is returned to you. Well, this is a lesson to me. I'll never trust myself on the train again. And all I wish is that I was safely off this one. This fuss has worked my nerves all up again. Don't worry, Grandma. I'll see you safely off the train when we get to Green Village. Will you, though? Will you now? said Grandma eagerly. I'll be real easy in mind, then, she added with a returning smile. I feel as if I could trust you for anything, and I'm a real suspicious person, too. They had a long talk after that. Or rather, Grandma talked, and the dark man listened and smiled. She told him all about William George, and Delilah, and the baby, and about Samuel, and Adelaide, and Cyrus and Louise, and the three cats, and the parrot. He seemed to enjoy her accounts of them, too. When they reached Green Village Station... He gathered up Grandma's parcels and helped her tenderly off the train. Anybody here to meet Mrs. Sheldon? he asked of the station master. And the latter shook his head. Don't think so. Haven't seen anybody here to meet anybody tonight. Dear, oh dear, said poor Grandma. This is just what I expected. 
and they've never got Cyrus's telegram. Well, I might have known it. What shall I do? How far is it to your sons? asked the dark man. Only half a mile, just over the hill there, but I'll never get there alone this dark night. Of course not, but I'll go with you. The road is good. We'll do finely. But that train won't wait for you, gasped Grandma, half in protest. It doesn't matter. The Starmont Freight passes here in half an hour, and I'll go on her. Come along, Grandma. Oh, but you're good, said Grandma. Some woman is proud to have you for a son. The man did not answer. He had not answered any of the personal remarks Grandma had made to him in her conversation. They were not long in reaching William George Sheldon's house. For the village road was good, and Grandma was smart on her feet. She was welcome with eagerness and surprise. To think that there was no one to meet you, exclaimed William George. But I never dreamed of your coming by train, knowing how you were set against it. Telegram? No. I got no telegram. Suppose Cyrus forgot to send it. I am most heartily obliged to you, sir, for looking after my mother so kindly. It was my pleasure, said the dark man courteously. He had taken off his hat, and they saw a curious scar, shaped like a large red butterfly, high up on his forehead under his hair. I am delighted to have been of any assistance to her. He would not wait for supper. The next train would be in, and he must not miss it. There are people looking for me, he said with his curious smile. They will be much disappointed if they do not find me. He had gone, and the whistle of the Starmont Freight had blown before Grandma remembered that he had not given her his name and address. Dear, oh dear, how are we ever going to send that money to him? she exclaimed. And he's so nice and good-hearted. Grandma worried over this for a week, in the intervals of looking after Delilah. One day... William George came in with a large city daily in his hands. He looked curiously at Grandma and then showed her the front-page picture of a man, clean-shaven, with an oddly shaped scar high up on his forehead. Did you ever see that man, Mother? he asked. Of course I did, said Grandma excitedly. Why, it's the man I met on the train. Who is he? What is his name? Now we'll know where to send. That is Mark Hartwell, who shot Amos Gray at Charlottesville three weeks ago, said William George quietly. Grandma looked at him blankly for a moment. It couldn't be, she gasped at last. That man, a murderer. I'll never believe it. It's true enough, mother. The whole story is here. He had shaved his beard and dyed his hair, and came near getting clear out of the country. And they were on his trail the day he came down in the train with you, and lost it because of his getting off to bring you here. His disguise was so perfect that there was little fear of his being recognized, so long as he hid that scar. But it was seen in Montreal, and he was run to earth there. He has made a full confession. I don't care, cried Grandma valiantly. I'll never believe he was all bad. A man who would do what he did for a poor old woman like me. When he was flying for his life too. No, no, there was good in him, even if he did kill that man. And I'm sure he must feel terrible over it. In this view... Grandma persisted. She never would say or listen to a word against Mark Hartwell. And she had only pity for him whom everyone else condemned. With her own trembling hands, she wrote him a letter to accompany the money 
Samuel sent before Hartwell was taken to the penitentiary for life. She thanked him again for his kindness to her, and assured him that she knew he was sorry for what he had done, and that she would pray for him every night of her life. Mark Hartwell had been hard and defiant enough, but the prison officials told that he cried like a child over Grandma Sheldon's little letter. There's nobody all bad, says Grandma when she relates the story. I used to believe a murderer must be, but I know better now. I think of that poor man often and often. He was so kind and gentle to me. He must have been a good boy once. I write him a letter every Christmas, and I send him tracts and papers. He's my own little charity. But I've never been on the cars since, and I never will be again. You never can tell what will happen to you or what sort of people you'll meet if you trust yourself on a train. The Letters Just before the letter was brought to me that evening, I was watching the red November sunset from the library window. It was a stormy, unrestful sunset, gleaming angrily through the dark fur bows that were now and again tossed suddenly and disgracefully in a fitful gust of wind. Below in the garden it was quite dark, and I could only see dimly the dead leaves that were whirling and dancing uncannily over the roseless paths. The poor dead leaves, yet not quite dead. There was still enough unquiet life left in them to make them restless and forlorn. They hearkened yet to every call of the wind, who cared for them no longer, but only played freakishly with them and broke their rest. I felt sorry for the leaves as I watched them in that dull, weird twilight, and angry in a petulant fashion that almost made me laugh with the wind that would not leave them in peace. Why should they and I be vexed with these transient breaths of desire for a life that had passed us by? I was in the grip of a bitter loneliness that evening, so bitter and so insistent that I felt I could not face the future at all. Even with such poor fragments of courage as I had gathered about me after father's death, hoping that they would, at last, suffice for my endurance, if not for my content. But now they fell away from me at sight of the emptiness of life. The emptiness. Ah, it was from that I shrank. I could have faced pain and anxiety and heartbreak undoubtedly, but I could not face that terrible, yawning, barren emptiness. I put my hands over my eyes to shut it out, but it pressed in upon my consciousness insistently and would not be ignored longer. The moment a woman realizes that she has nothing to live for, neither love nor purpose, nor duty, holds for her the bitterness of death. She is a brave woman indeed, who can look upon such a prospect unquailingly, and I was not brave. I was weak and timid. Had not father often laughed mockingly at me because of it? It was three weeks since father had died. My proud, handsome, unrelenting old father, whom I had loved so intensely, and who had never loved me. I had always accepted this fact unresentfully and unquestioningly, but it had steeped my whole life in its tincture of bitterness. My father had never forgiven me for two things. I had cost my mother's life 
and I was not a son to perpetuate the old name and carry on the family feud with the Frasers. I was a very lonely child, with no playmates or companions of any sort, and my girlhood was lonely as hell. The only passion in my life was my love for my father. I would have done and suffered anything to win his affection in return. But all I ever did win was an amused tolerance. And I was grateful for that, almost content. It was much to have something to love and be permitted to love it. If I had been a beautiful and spirited girl, I think father might have loved me, but I was neither. At first, I did not think or care about my lack of beauty. Then, one day, I was alone in the beech wood. I was trying to disentangle my skirt, which had caught on some thorny underbrush. A young man came around the curve of the path and, seeing my predicament, bent with murmured apology to help me. He had to kneel to do it, and I saw a ray of sunshine falling through the beeches above us, strike like a lance of light athwart the thick brown hair that pushed out from under his cap. Before I thought, I put out my hand and touched it softly, and then I blushed crimson with shame over what I had done. But he did not know. He never knew. When he had released my dress, he rose, and our eyes met for a moment as I timidly thanked him. I saw that he was good to look upon, tall and straight, with broad, stalwart shoulders, and a dark, clean-cut face. He had a firm, sensitive mouth and kindly, pleasant, dark blue eyes. It made my heart beat strangely, but it was only for a moment. And the next, he had lifted his cap and passed on. As I went homeward, I wondered who he might be. He must be a stranger, I thought, probably a visitor in some of our few neighboring families. I wondered, too, if I should meet him again, and found the thought very pleasant. I knew few men, and they were all old, like father, or at least elderly. They were the only people who ever came to our house, and they either teased me or overlooked me. None of them was at all like this young man I had met in the beech wood, nor ever could have been, I thought. When I reached home, I stopped before the big mirror that hung in the hall, and did what I had never done before in my life, looked at myself very scrutinizingly, and wondered if I had any beauty. I could only sorrowfully conclude that I had not. I was so slight and pale, and the thick black hair and dark eyes that might have been pretty in another woman seemed only to accentuate the lack of spirit and regularity in my features. I was still standing there, gazing wistfully at my mirrored face with a strange sinking of spirit. When father came through the hall, his riding whip in his hand, seeing me, he laughed. Don't waste your time gazing into mirrors, Isabel, he said carelessly. That might have been excusable in former ladies of Shirley, whose beauty might pardon and even adorn vanity. But with you it is only absurd. The needle and the cookbook are all that you need to concern yourself with. I was accustomed to such speeches from him, but they had never hurt me so cruelly before. At that moment I would have given all the world only to be beautiful. The next Sunday I looked across the church and in the Fraser pew I saw the young man I had met in the wood. 
He was looking at me with his arms folded over his breast, and on his brow a little frown that seemed somehow indicative of pain and surprise. I felt a miserable sense of disappointment. If he were the Fraser's guest, I could not expect to meet him again. Father hated the Fraser's. All the Shirleys hated them. It was an old feud, bitter and lasting, that had been as much our inheritance for generations as land and money. The only thing Father had ever taken pains to teach me was detestation of the Frasers and all their works. I accepted this as I accepted all the other traditions of my race. I thought it did not matter much. The Frasers were not likely to come my way, and hatred was a good satisfying passion in the lack of all else. I think I rather took a pride in hating them, as became my blood. I did not look at the Fraser Pew again, but outside, under the elms, we met him, standing in the dappling light and shadow. He looked very handsome, and a little sad. I could not help glancing back over my shoulder as father and I walked to the gate and I saw him looking after us with that little frown, which again made me think something had hurt him. I liked better the smile he had worn in the beech wood, but I had an odd liking for the frown too, and I think I had a foolish longing to go back to him, put up my fingers and smooth it away. So, Alan Fraser has come home, said my father. Alan Fraser, I repeated, with a strange, horrible feeling of coldness and chill coming over me like a shadow on a bright day. Alan Fraser, the son of old Malcolm Fraser of Glenellan, the son of our enemy, he had been living since childhood with his dead mother's people. So much I knew. And this was he. Something stung and smarted in my eyes. I think the sting and smart might have turned to tears if father had not been looking down at me. Yes, didn't you see him in his father's pew? But I forgot. You are too demure to be looking at a young man in preaching. Or out of it, Isabel. You are a model young woman. Odd that the man never liked to model young women. Curse old Malcolm Fraser. What right has he to have a son like that, when I have nothing but a puling girl? Remember, Isabel, that if you ever meet that young man, you are not to speak to or look at him, or even intimate that you are aware of his existence. He is your enemy, and the enemy of your race. You will show him that you realize this. Of course, that ended it all. Though just what there had been to end would have been hard to say. Not long afterwards, I met Alan Fraser again, when I was out for a canter on my mare. He was strolling through the beechwood with a couple of big collies, and he stopped short as I drew near. I had to do it. Father had decreed. My surely pride demanded that I should do it. I looked him unseeingly in the face, struck my mare a blow with my whip, and dashed past him. I even felt angry, I think, that a Fraser should have the power to make me feel so badly in doing my duty. After that I had forgotten. There was nothing to make me remember, for I never met Alan Fraser again. The years slipped by, one by one, so like each other in their colorlessness, that I forgot to take account of them. I only knew that I grew older, and that it did not matter, since there was nobody to care. One day they brought father in, 
white-lipped and groaning. His mare had thrown him, and he was never to walk again, although he lived for five years. Those five years had been the happiest of my life. For the first time, I was necessary to someone. There was something for me to do, which nobody else could do so well. I was father's nurse and companion, and I found my pleasure in tending him and amusing him, soothing his hours of pain and brightening his hours of ease. People said I did my duty toward him. I had never liked that word, duty, since the day I had ridden past Alan Fraser in the beechwood. I could not connect it with what I did for father. It was my delight because I loved him. I did not mind the moods and the irritable outbursts that drove others from him. But now he was dead, and I sat in the solemn dusk, wishing that I need not go on with life either. The loneliness of the big echoing house weighed on my spirit. I was solitary without companionship. I looked out on the outside world, where the only sign of human habitation visible to my eyes was the light twinkling out from the library window of Glenellan on the dark fir hill two miles away. By that light, I knew, Alan Fraser must have returned from his long sojourn abroad, for it only shone when he was at Glenellan. He still lived there, something of a hermit, people said. He had never married, and he cared nothing for society. His companions were books, and dogs, and horses. He was given to scientific researches, and wrote much for the reviews. He traveled a great deal, so much I knew in a vague way. I even saw him occasionally in church, and never thought the years had changed him much, save that his face was sadder and sterner than of old, and his hair has become iron gray. People said that he had inherited and cherished the old hatred of the Shirleys, that he was very bitter against us. I believed it. He had the face of a good hater, or lover, a man who could play with no emotion, but must take it in all earnestness and intensity. When it was quite dark, the housekeeper brought in the lights and handed me a letter, which, she said, a man had just brought up from the village post office. I looked at it curiously before I opened it, wondering from whom it was. It was postmarked from a city several miles away, and the firm decided rather peculiar handwriting was strange to me. I had no correspondence. After father's death, I had received a few perfunctory notes of condolence from distant relatives and family friends. They had hurt me cruelly, for they seemed to exhale a subtle spirit of congratulation on my being released from a long and unpleasant martyrdom of attendance on an invalid that quite overrode the decorous phrases of conventional sympathy in which they were expressed. I hated those letters for their implied injustice. I was not thankful for my release. I missed father miserably, and longed passionately for the very tasks and vigils that had evoked their pity. This letter did not seem like one of those. I opened it and took out some stiff, blackly written sheets. They were undated, and turning to the last, I saw that they were unsigned. With a not unpleasant tingling of interest, I sat down by my desk to read. The letter began abruptly. You will not know by whom this is written. Do not seek to know, now or ever. It is only from behind the veil of your ignorance of my identity that I can ever write to you fully and freely 
as I wish to write. Can say what I wish to say in words denied to a formal and conventional expression of sympathy. Dear lady, let me say to you thus, what is in my heart? I know what your sorrow is, and I think I know what your loneliness must be, the sorrow of a broken tie, the loneliness of a life thrown emptily back on itself. I know how you loved your father, how you must have loved him if those eyes and brow and mouth speak truth for they tell of a nature divinely rich and deep. Giving of its wealth and tenderness ungrudgingly to those who are so happy as to be the objects of its affection. To such a nature, bereavement must bring a depth and an agony of grief unknown to the shallower souls. I know what your father's helplessness and need of you meant to you. I know that now life must seem to you a broken and embittering thing, and knowing this, I venture to send this greeting across the gulf of strangehood between us, telling you that my understanding sympathy is fully and freely yours, and bidding you take heart for the future, which now, it may be, looks so heartless and hopeless to you. Believe me, dear lady, it will be neither. Courage will come to you with the kind days. You will find noble tasks to do. Beautiful and gracious duties wait along your path. The pain and suffering of the world never dies. And while it lives, there will be work for such as you to do. And in the doing of it, you will find comfort and strength and the highest joy of living. I believe in you. I believe you will make of your life a beautiful and worthy thing. I give you Godspeed for the years to come. Out of my own loneliness, I, an unknown friend who has never clasped your hand, sent this message to you. I understand. I have always understood. And I say to you, be of good cheer. To say that this strange letter was a mystery to me seems an inadequate way of stating the matter. I was completely bewildered, nor could I even guess who the writer might be, think and ponder as I might. The letter itself implied that the writer was a stranger. The handwriting was evidently that of a man, and I knew no man who could or would have sent such a letter to me. The very mystery stung me to interest. As for the letter itself, it brought me an uplift of hope and inspiration such as I would not have believed possible an hour earlier. It rang so truly and sincerely, and the mere thought that somewhere I had a friend who cared enough to write it even in such odd fashion, was so sweet that I was half ashamed of the difference it made in my outlook. Sitting there, I took courage and made a compact with myself that I would justify the writer's faith in me, that I would take up my life as something to be worthily lived for all good to the disregard of my own selfish sorrow and shrinking. I would seek for something to do, for interests which could bind me to my fellow creatures, for tasks which would lessen the pains and perils of humankind. An hour before, this would not have seemed to me possible. Now it seemed the right and natural thing to do. A week later, another letter came. I welcomed it with an eagerness which I feared was almost childish. It was a much longer letter than the first, and was written in quite a different strain. 
There was no apology for or explanation of the motive for writing. It was as if the letter were merely one of a permitted and established correspondence between old friends. It began with a witty, sparkling review of a new book the writer had just read, and passed from this to crisp comments on great events, political, scientific, artistic, of the day. The whole letter was pungent, interesting, delightful, in a personal essay on a dozen vital topics of life and thoughts. Only at the end was a personal note struck. Are you interested in these things? ran the last paragraph. In what is being done and suffered and attained in the great busy world? I think you must be, for I have seen you and read what is written in your face. I believe you care for these things as I do, that your being thrills to the still, sad music of humanity, that the songs of the poets I love find an echo in your spirit, and the aspirations of all struggling souls a sympathy in your heart. Believing this, I have written freely to you, taking a keen pleasure in thus revealing my thoughts and visions to one who will understand. For I too am friendless, in the sense of one standing alone, shut out from the sweet, intimate communion of feeling and opinion that may be held with the heart's friends. Shall you have read this as a friend, I wonder, a candid, uncritical, understanding friend? Let me hope it, dear lady. I was expecting the third letter when it came, but not until it did come did I realize what my disappointment would have been if it had not. After that, every week brought me a letter. Soon those letters were the greatest interest in my life. I had given up all attempts to solve the mystery of their coming, and was content to enjoy them for themselves alone. From week to week I looked forward to them with an eagerness that I would hardly confess, even to myself. And such letters as they were, growing longer and fuller and freer as time went on, such wise, witty, brilliant, pungent letters, stimulating all my tropic life into tingling zest. I had begun to look abroad in my small world for worthy work and found plenty to do. My unknown friend evidently kept track of my expanding efforts, for he commented and criticized, encouraged and advised freely. There was a humor in his letters that I liked. It leavened them with its sanity and reacted on me most wholesomely counteracting many of the morbid tendencies and influences of my life. I found myself striving to live up to the writer's ideal of philosophy and ambition, as pictured, often unconsciously, in his letters. And they were an intellectual stimulant as well. To understand them fully, I found it necessary to acquaint myself thoroughly with the literature and art the science and the politics they touched upon. After every letter there was something new for me to hunt out and learn and assimilate, until my old narrow mental attitude had so broadened and deepened, sweeping out into circles of thought I had never known or imagined, that I hardly knew myself. They had been coming for a year before I began to reply to them, I had often wished to do so. There were so many things I wanted to say and discuss, but it seemed foolish to write letters that could not be sent. One day, a letter came that kindled my imagination and stirred my heart and soul so deeply that the day insistently demanded answering expression. I sat down at my desk and wrote a full reply to it. 
safe in the belief that the mysterious friend to whom it was written would never see it. I wrote with a perfect freedom and a total lack of self-consciousness that I could never have attained otherwise. The writing of that letter gave me a pleasure second only to that which the reading of his brought. For the first time I discovered the delight of revealing my thoughts unhindered by the conventions. Also, I understood better why the writer of those letters had written them, and doubtless he had enjoyed doing so and was not impelled thereto simply by a purely philanthropic wish to help me. When my letter was finished, I sealed it up and locked it away in my desk with a smile at my middle-aged folly. What, I wondered, would all my sedate, serious friends, my associates of mission and hospital committees, think if they knew? Well, everybody has, or should have, a pet nonsense in her life. I did not think mine was any sillier than some others I knew, and to myself I admitted that it was very sweet. I knew if those letters ceased to come, all safer would go out of my life. After that, I wrote a reply to every letter I received, and kept them all locked up together. It was delightful. I wrote out all my doings and perplexities and hopes and plans and wishes. Yes, and my dreams. The secret romance of it all made me look on existence with joyous, contented eyes. Gradually, a change crept over the letters I received. Without ever affording the slightest clue to the identity of the writer, they grew more intimate and personal. A subtle, caressing note of tenderness breathed from them and thrilled my heart curiously. I felt as if I were being drawn into the writer's life, admitted into the most sacred recesses of his thoughts and feelings. Yet it was all done so subtly, so delicately, that I was unconscious of the change until I discovered it in reading over the older letters and comparing them with the later ones. Finally, a letter came, my first love letter. And surely never was a love letter received under stranger circumstances. It began abruptly, as all the letters had begun, plunging into the middle of the writer's strain of thought, without any preface. The first words drove the blood to my heart, and then sent it flying hotly all over my face. I love you. I must say it at last. Have you not guessed it before? It has trembled on my pen in every line I have written to you. Yet, I have never dared to shape it into words before. I know not how I dare now. I only know that I must. What a delight to write it out and know that you will read it. Tonight the mood is on me to tell it to you recklessly and lavishly, never pausing to stint obey words. Sweetheart, I love you. Love you, love you. Dear true, faithful woman soul, I love you with all the heart of a man. Ever since I first saw you, I have loved you. I can never come to tell you so in spoken words. I can only love you from afar and tell my love under the guise of impersonal friendship. It matters not to you but it matters more than all else in life to me. I am glad that I love you, dear. Glad, glad, glad. There was much more, for it was a long letter. When I had read it, I buried my burning face in my hands, 
trembling with happiness. This strange confession of love meant so much to me. My heart leapt forth to meet it with answering love. What mattered it that we could never meet? That I could not even guess who my lover was? Somewhere in the world was a love that was mine alone, and mine wholly, and mine forever. What mattered his name, or his situation, or the mysterious barrier between us? Spirit leapt to the spirit unhindered over the fettering bounds of matter and time. I loved and was beloved. Nothing else mattered. I wrote my answer to his letter. I wrote it fearlessly and unstintedly. Perhaps I could not have written so freely if the letter were to have been read by him. As it was, I poured out the riches of my love as fully as he had done. I kept nothing back, and across the gulf between us I vowed a faithful and enduring love in response to his. The next day I went to town on business with my lawyers. Neither of the members of the firm was in when I called, but I was an old client, and one of the clerks showed me into the private office to wait. As I sat down, my eyes fell on a folded letter lying on the table beside me. With a shock of surprise, I recognized the writing. I could not be mistaken. I should have recognized it anywhere. The letter was lying by its envelope, so folded that only the middle third of the page was visible. An irresistible impulse swept over me before I could reflect that I had no business to touch the letter, that perhaps it was unfair to my unknown friend to seek to discover his identity when he wished to hide it. I had turned the letter over and seen the signature. I laid it down again and stood up, dizzy, breathless, unseeing. Like a woman in a dream, I walked through the outer office and into the street. I must have walked on for blocks before I became conscious of my surroundings. The name I had seen signed to that letter was Alan Fraser. No doubt. The reader has long ago guessed it, has wondered why I had not. The fact remains that I had not. Out of the whole world, Alan Fraser was the last man whom I should have suspected to be the writer of those letters. Alan Fraser, my hereditary enemy, who, I had been told, cherished the old feud so faithfully and bitterly and hated our very name. And yet, I now wondered at my long blindness. No one else could have written those letters. No one but him. I read them over, one by one, when I reached home. And, now that I possessed the key, he revealed himself in every line, expression, thought. And he loved me. I thought of the old feud and hatred. I thought of my pride and traditions. They seemed like the dust and ashes of outworn things. Things to be smiled at and cast aside. I took out all the letters I had written, all except the last one, sealed them up in a parcel and directed it to Alan Fraser. Then, summoning my groom, I bade him write to Glenellen with it. His look of amazement almost made me laugh, but after he was gone I felt dizzy and frightened at my own daring. When the autumn darkness came down, I went to my room and dressed, as the woman dresses who awaits the one man of all the world. I hardly knew what I hoped or expected but I was all a thrill with a nameless, inexplicable happiness. I admit 
I looked very eagerly into the mirror when I was done, and I thought that the result was not unpleasing. Beauty had never been mine, but a faint reflection of it came over me in the tremulous flush and excitement of the moment. Then the maid came up to tell me that Alan Fraser was in the library. I went down with my cold hands tightly clasped behind me. He was standing by the library table, a tall, broad-shouldered man, with the light striking upward on his dark, sensitive face and iron-gray hair. When he saw me, he came quickly forward. So you know, and you are not angry. Your letters told me so much. I have loved you since that day in the beech wood, Isabel. Isabel. His eyes were kindling into mine. He held my hands in a close, impetuous clasp. His voice was infinitely caressing as he pronounced my name. I had never heard it since father died. I had never heard it at all so musically and tenderly uttered. My ancestors might have turned in their graves just then, but it mattered not. Living love had driven out dead hatred. Isabel, he went on, there was one letter and answered, the last. I went to my desk, took out the last letter I had written, and gave it to him in silence. While he read it, I stood in a shadowy corner and watched him, wondering if life could always be as sweet as this. When he had finished, he turned to me and held out his arms. I went to them as a bird to her nest, and with his lips against mine, the old feud was bottled out forever. Nan. Nan was polishing the tumblers at the pantry window, outside of which John Osborne was leaning among the vines. His arms were folded on the sill, and his straw hat was pushed back from his flushed, eager face as he watched Nan's deft movements. Beyond them, old Abe Stewart was mowing the grass in the orchard with a Sith, and casting uneasy glances at the pair. Old Abe did not approve of John Osborne as a suitor for Nan. John was poor, and old Abe, although he was the wealthiest farmer in Granville, was bent on Nan's making a good match. He looked upon John Osborne as a mere fortune hunter, and it was a thorn in the flesh to see him talking to Nan, while he, old Abe, was too far away to hear what they were saying. He had a good deal of confidence in Nan. She was a sensible, level-headed girl. Still, there was no knowing what freak even a sensible girl might take into her head. And Nan was so determined when she did make up her mind. She was his own daughter in that. However, old Abe need not have worried himself. It could not be said that Nan was helping John Osborne on his wooing at all. Instead, she was teasing and snubbing him by turns. Nan was very pretty. Moreover, Nan was well aware of the fact. She knew that the way her dark hair curled around her ears and forehead was bewitching, that her complexion was the envy of every girl in Cranville, that her long lashes had a trick of drooping over very soft dark eyes, in a fashion calculated to turn masculine heads hopelessly. John Osborne knew all this too to his cost. He had called to ask Nan to go with him to the Lone Lake picnic next day, 
At this request, Nan dropped her eyes and murmured that she was sorry, but he was too late. She had promised to go with somebody else. There was no need of Nan's making such a mystery about it. The somebody else was her only cousin, Ned Bennett, who had had a quarrel with his own girl. The latter lived on Lone Lake, and Ned had coaxed Nan to go over with him and try her hand at patching matters up between him and his offended lady love. And Nan, who was an amiable creature and tender-hearted, where anybody's lover except her own was concerned, had agreed to go. But John Osborne at once jumped to the conclusion, as Nan had very possibly meant him to do, that the mysterious somebody was Brian Lee, and the thought was gall and wormwood to him. Whom are you going with? he asked. That would be telling, Nan said with maddening indifference. Is it Brian Lee? demanded John. It might be, said Nan reflectively. And then again, you know, it mightn't. John was silent. He was no match for Nan when it came to a war of words. He scowled moodily at the shining tumblers. Nan, I'm going out west, he said finally. Nan stared at him with her last tumbler poised in mid-air, very much as if he had announced his intention of going to the North Pole or Equatorial Africa. John Osborne, are you crazy? Not quite, and I'm in earnest. I can tell you that. Nan set the glass down with a decided thud. John's curtness displeased her. He needn't suppose that it made any difference to her if he took it into his stupid head to go to Afghanistan. Oh, she remarked carelessly. Well, I suppose if you've got the western fever, your case is hopeless. Would it be impertinent to inquire why you are going? There's nothing else for me to do, Nan, said John. Brian Lee is going to foreclose the mortgage next month, and I'll have to clear out. He says he can't wait any longer. I've worked hard enough and done my best to keep the old place, but it's been uphill work, and I'm beaten at last. Nan sat blankly down on the stool by the window. Her face was a study, which John Osborne, watching old Abe's movements, missed. Well, I never, she gasped. John Osborne, do you mean to tell me that Brian Lee is going to do that? How did he come to get your mortgage? Bought it from old Townsend, answered John briefly. Oh, he's within his rights, I'll admit. I've even got behind with the interest this past year. I'll go out west and begin over again. It's a burning shame, said Nan violently. John looked around in time to see two very red spots on her cheeks. You don't care, though, Nan. I don't like to see anyone unjustly treated, declared Nan. And that is what you've been. You've never had half a chance, and after the way you've slaved too. If Lee would wait a little, I might do something yet, now that Aunt Alice is gone, said John bitterly. I'm not afraid to work, but he won't. He means to take his bite out at last. Nan hesitated. Surely Brian isn't so mean as that, she stammered. Perhaps he'll change his mind if, if... Osborne wheeled about, his face aflame. Don't you say a word to him about it, Nan, he cried. Don't you go interceding with him for me. I've got some pride left. He can take the farm from me, and he can take you, maybe, but he can't take my self-respect. I won't beg him for mercy, 
don't you dare to say a word to him about it. Nan's eyes flashed. She was offended to find her sympathy flung back in her face. Don't be alarmed, she said tartly. I shan't bother myself about your concerns. I have no doubt you are able to look out for them yourself. Osborne turned away. As he did so, he saw Brian Lee driving up the lane. Perhaps Nan saw it too. At any rate, she leaned out of the window. John! John! Osborne half turned. You'll be up again soon, won't you? His face hardened. I'll come to say goodbye before I go, of course, he answered shortly. He came face to face with Lee at the gate, where the latter was tying his sleek chestnut to a poplar. He acknowledged his rival's condescending nod with a scowl. Lee looked after him with a satisfied smile. Poor beggar, he muttered. He feels pretty cheap, I reckon. I've spoiled his chances in this quarter. Old Abe doesn't want any poverty-stricken hangers on about his place, and Nan won't dream of taking him when she knows he hasn't a roof over his head. He stopped for a chat with Old Abe. Old Abe approved of Brian Lee. He was a son-in-law after Old Abe's heart. Meanwhile, Nan had seated herself at the pantry window and was ostentatiously hemming towels in apparent oblivion of suitor number two. Nevertheless, when Brian came up, she greeted him with an unusually sweet smile and at once plunged into an animated conversation. Brian had not come to ask her to go to the picnic. Business prevented him from going. He meant to find out if she were going with John Osborne. As Nan was serenely impervious to all hints, he was finally forced to ask her bluntly if she was going to the picnic. Well, yes, she expected to. Oh, might he ask with whom? Nan didn't know that it was a question of public interest at all. It isn't with that Osborne fellow, is it? demanded Brian incautiously. Nan tossed her head. Well, why not? she asked. Look here, Nan, said Lee angrily. If you're going to the picnic with John Osborne, I'm surprised at you. What do you mean by encouraging him so? He's as poor as Job's turkey. I suppose you've heard that I've been compelled to foreclose the mortgage on his farm. Nan kept her temper sweetly. A dangerous sign, had Brian but known it. Yes, he was telling me so this morning, she answered slowly. Oh, was he? I suppose he gave me my character. No, he didn't say very much about it at all. He said, of course, you were within your rights. But do you really mean to do it, Brian? Of course I do, said Brian promptly. I can't wait any longer for my money. And I'd never get it if I didn't. Osborne can't even pay the interest. It isn't because he hasn't worked hard enough, then, said Nan. He has just slaved on that place ever since he grew up. Well, yes... He has worked hard in a way, but he's kind of shiftless for all that. No manager, as you might say. Some folks would have been clear by now, but Osborne is one of those men that are bound to get behind. He hasn't got any business faculty. He isn't shiftless, said Nan quickly, and it isn't his fault if he has got behind. It's all because of his care for his aunt. He has had to spend more on her doctor's bills than would have raised the mortgage. And now that she's dead, and he might have a chance to pull up, you go and foreclose. A man must look out for number one, said Brian easily, admiring Nan's downcast eyes and rosy cheeks. 
I haven't any spite against Osborne, but business is business, you know? Nan opened her lips to say something, but remembering Osborne's parting injunction, she shut them again. She shot a scornful glance at Lee as he stood with his arms folded on the sill beside her. And Brian lingered, talking small talk, until Nan announced that she must see about getting tea. And you won't tell me who is going to take you to the picnic, he coaxed. Oh, it's Ned Bennett, said Nan indifferently. Brian felt relieved. He unpinned the huge cluster of violets on his coat and laid them down on the sill beside her before he went. Nan flicked him off with her fingers as she watched him cross the lawn, his own self-satisfied smile upon his face. A week later, the Osborne homestead had passed into Brian Lee's hands, and John Osborne was staying with his cousin at Thornhope, pending his departure for the West. He had never been to see Nan since that last afternoon, but Brian Lee haunted the Stuart place. One day he suddenly stopped coming, although Nan was discreetly silent. In due time it came to old Abe's ears, by various triplets of gossip, that Nan had refused him. Old Abe marched straight away home to Nan, in a fury, and demanded if this were true. Nan curtly admitted that it was. Old Abe was so much taken aback by her coolness that he asked almost meekly what was her reason for doing such a fool trick. Because he turned John Osborne out of house and home, returned Nan composedly. If he hadn't done that, there is no telling what might have happened. I might even have married him, because I like him very well, and it would have pleased you. At any rate, I wouldn't have married John when you were against him. Now I mean to. Old Abe stormed furiously at this, but Nan kept so provokingly cool that he was conscious of wasting breath. He went off in a rage, but Nan did not feel particularly anxious now that the announcement was over. He would cool down, she knew. John Osborne worried her more. She didn't see clearly how she was to marry him, unless he asked her, and he had studiously avoided her since the foreclosure. But Nan did not mean to be baffled, or to let her lover slip through her fingers for want of a little courage. She was not old Abe Stewart's daughter for nothing. One day, Ned Bennett dropped in and said that John Osborne would start for the West in three days. That evening, Nan went up to her room and dressed herself in the prettiest dress she owned, combed her hair around her sparkling face in bewitching curls, pinned a cluster of apple blossoms at her belt, and thus equipped, marched down in the golden sunset light to the Mill Creek Bridge. John Osborne, on his return from Thornhope half an hour later, found her there, leaning over the rail among the willows. Nan started in well-assumed surprise, and then asked him why he had not been to see her. John blushed, stammered, didn't know, had been busy. Nan cut short his halting excuses by demanding to know if he were really going away, and what he intended to do. I'll go out on the prairies and take up a claim, said Osborne sturdily. Begin life over again, free of debt. It'll be hard work, but I'm not afraid of that. I will succeed if it takes me years. They walked on in silence. Nan came to the conclusion that Osborne meant to hold his peace. John, she said tremulously, won't, won't you find it very lonely out there? Of course, I expect that. I shall have to get used to it. Nan grew nervous. 
proposing to a man was really very dreadful. Wouldn't it be nicer for you, she faltered. That is, it wouldn't be so lonely for you, would it, if, if you had me out there with you? John Osborne stopped squarely in the dusty road and looked at her. Nan, he exclaimed. Oh, if you can't take a hint, said Nan in despair. It was all of an hour later that a man drove past them as they loitered up the hill road in the twilight. It was Brian Lee. He had taken from Osborne his house and land. But he had not been able to take Nan Stewart after all. Miss Madeline's Proposal Auntie, I have something to tell you, said Lena with a blush that made her look more than ever like one of the climbing roses that nodded about the windows of the old Churchill place, as it was always called in Lower Wentworth. Miss Madeline, sitting in the low rocker by the parlor window, seemed like the presiding genius of the place. Everything about her matched her sweet old-fashionedness, from the crown of her soft brown hair, dressed in the style of her long-ago girlhood, to the toes of her daintily slippered feet. Outside of the old Churchill place, in the busy streets of the up-to-date little town, Miss Madeline might have seemed out of harmony with her surroundings. But here, in this dim room, faintly scented with whiffs from the rose garden outside, she was like a note in some sweet, perfect melody of old time. Alina, sitting on the little stool at Miss Madeline's feet, with her curly head in her aunt's lap, was as pretty as Miss Madeline herself had once been. She was also very happy, and her happiness seemed to envelop her as in an atmosphere and lend her a new radiance and charm. Miss Madeline loved her pretty niece very dearly and patted the curly head tenderly with her slender white hands. What is it, my dear? I'm... I'm engaged, whispered Lena, hiding her face in Miss Madeline's flowered muslin lap. Engaged? Miss Madeline's tone was one of surprise and awe. She blushed as she said the word as deeply as Lena had done. Then she went on with a little quiver of excitement in her voice. To whom, my dear? Oh, you don't know him, auntie, but I hope you will soon. His name is Ralph Wildey. Isn't it pretty? I met him last winter, and we became very good friends. But we had a quarrel before I came down here, and... Oh, I have been so unhappy over it. Three weeks ago, he wrote me and begged my pardon. So nice of him. Because I was really all to blame, you know? And he said he loved me. And all that, you know. No, I don't know said Miss Madeline gently. But, but, I can imagine. Oh, I was so happy. I wrote back and I had this letter from him today. He is coming down tomorrow. You will be glad to see him, won't you, Auntie? Oh, yes, yes, dear. I am glad for your sake. Very glad. You are sure you love him? Yes, indeed said Lena with a little laugh, as if wondering how anyone could doubt it. Presently, Miss Madeline said in a shy voice, Lena, did, uh, did you ever receive a proposal of marriage from anybody besides Mr. Bildy? Lena laughed roguishly. Why, yes, auntie, ever so many, a dozen at least. Oh, my dear, cried Miss Madeline in a slight shocked tone. But I did, really, 
Sometimes it was horrid, and sometimes it was funny. It all depended on the man. Dear me, how red and uncomfortable most of them looked. All but the fifth. He was so cool and businesslike that he almost surprised me into accepting him. And, and what did you feel like, Lena? Oh, frightened, mostly. But I always wanted to laugh, too. You must know how it is yourself, Auntie. What did you feel like when somebody proposed to you? Miss Madeline flushed from chin to brow. Oh, Lena, she faltered, as if she were confessing something very disgraceful, yet to which she was impelled by her strict truthfulness. I, I never had a proposal in my life, not one. Lena opened her big brown eyes in amazement. Why, Aunt Madeline, and you so pretty, what was the reason? I've often wondered, said Miss Madeline faintly. I was pretty, as you say. It's so long ago I can say that now. And I had many gentlemen friends. But nobody ever wanted to marry me. I sometimes wish that, that I could have had just one proposal. Not that I wanted to marry, you know, I do not mean that. But just so that it wouldn't have seemed that I was different from anybody else. It is very foolish of me to wish it, I know, and even wicked. For if I had not cared for the person, it would have made him very unhappy. But then he would have forgotten and I would have remembered. It would always have been something to be a little proud of. Yes, said Lena absently. Her thoughts had gone back to Ralph. That evening, a letter was left on the front door of the old Churchill place. It was addressed in a scholarly hand to Miss Madeline Churchill, and Amelia Kent took it in. Amelia had been Miss Madeline's help for years and had grown gray in her service. In Amelia's loyal eyes, Miss Madeline was still young and beautiful. She never doubted that the letter was for her mistress. Nobody else there was ever addressed as Miss Madeline. Miss Madeline was sitting by the window of her own room, watching the sunset through the elms and reading her evening portion of Thomas a Kempis. She never liked to be disturbed when so employed, but she read a letter after Amelia had gone out. When she came to a certain paragraph, she turned very pale, and Thomas a Kempis fell to the floor unheeded. When she had finished the letter, she laid it on her lap, clasped her hands, and said, Oh, 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 in a faint, tremulous voice. Her cheeks were very pink and her eyes very bright. She did not even pick up Thomas a Kempis, but went to the door and called Lena. What is it, Auntie? asked Lena curiously, noticing the signs of unusual excitement about Miss Madeline. Miss Madeline held out her letter with a trembling hand. Lena, dear, this is a letter from Reverend Cecil Thorne. It, it is a proposal of marriage. I feel terribly upset. How very strange that it should come so soon after our talk this morning. I want you to read it. Perhaps I ought not to show it to anyone, but I would like you to see it. Lena took the letter and read it thoroughly. It was unmistakably a proposal of marriage, and was, moreover, a very charming epistle of its kind, albeit a little stiff and old-fashioned. How funny, said Lena when she came to the end. Funny, exclaimed Miss Madeline, with a trace of indignation in her gentle voice. Oh, I didn't mean that the letter was funny, 
Lena hastened to explain. Only that, as you said, it is odd to think of it coming so soon after our talk. But this was a little fib on Lena's part. She had thought that the letter, or rather the fact that it had been written to Miss Madeline, funny. The Reverend Cecil Thorne was Miss Madeline's pastor. He was a handsome, scholarly man of middle age, and Lena had seen a good deal of him during her summer in Lower Wentworth. She had taught the infant class in Sunday school, and sometimes she had thought that the minister was in love with her. But she must have been mistaken, she reflected. It must have been her aunt, after all, and the Reverend Cecil Thorne's shyly displayed interest in her must have been purely professional. What a goose I was to be afraid he was in love with me, she thought. Aloud, she said, he says he will come tomorrow evening to receive your answer. And oh, what can I say to him, murmured Miss Madeline in dismay. She wished she had a little of Lena's experience. You are going to? You will accept him, won't you? asked Lena curiously. Oh, my dear, no, cried Miss Madeline almost vehemently. I couldn't think of such a thing. I am very sorry. Do you think he will feel badly? Judging from his letter, I feel sure he will, said Lena decidedly. Miss Madeline sighed. Oh, dear me. It is very unpleasant. But of course I must refuse him. What a beautiful letter he writes, too. I feel very much disturbed by this. Miss Madeline picked up Thomas Akempis, smoothed him out repeatedly, and placed the letter between his leaves. When the Reverend Cecil Thorne called at the old Churchill place next evening at sunset, and asked for Miss Madeline Churchill, Amelia showed him into the parlor and went to call her mistress. Mr. Thorne sat down by the window that looked out on the lawn. His heart gave a bound as he caught a glimpse of an airy white muslin among the trees and a ripple of distant laughter. The next minute Lena appeared, strolling down the secluded path that curved about the birches. A young man was walking beside her with his arm around her. They crossed the green square before the house and disappeared in the rose garden. Mr. Thorne leaned back in his chair and put his hand over his eyes. He felt that he had received his answer, and it was a very bitter moment for him. He had hardly dared hope that this bright, beautiful child could care for him, Yet the realization came home to him nonetheless keenly. When Miss Madeline, paling and flushing by turns, came shyly in, he had recovered his self-control sufficiently to be able to say, Good evening, in a calm voice. Miss Madeline sat down opposite to him. At that moment she was devoutly thankful that she had never had any other proposal to refuse. It was a dreadful ordeal. If he could only help her out. But he did not speak, and every moment of the silence made it worse. I received your letter, Mr. Thorne, she faltered at last, looking distressfully down at the floor. My letter, Mr. Thorne, turned towards her. In her agitation, Miss Madeline did not notice the surprise in his face and tone. Yes, she said, gaining a little courage, since the ice was broken. It, it was a very great surprise to me. I never thought you, you cared for me as, as you said. And I am very sorry because, because I cannot return your affection. And so... Of course, I cannot marry you. Mr. Thorne put his hand over his eyes again. 
he understood now that there had been some mistake, and that Miss Madeline had received the letter he had written to her niece. Well, it did not matter. The appearance of the young man in the garden had settled that. Would he tell Miss Madeline of her mistake? No, it would only humiliate her, and it made no difference, since she had refused him. I suppose it is of no use to ask you to reconsider your decision. Oh, no, cried Miss Madeline, most aghast. She was afraid he might ask it after all. Not in the least use. I am sorry, so very sorry, that I could not answer differently. We, I hope, this will make no difference in our friendly relations, Mr. Thorne. Not at all said Mr. Thorne gravely. We will try to forget that it has happened. He bowed sadly and went out. Miss Madeline watched him guiltily as he walked across the lawn. He looked heartbroken. How dreadful it had been. And Lena had refused twelve men. How could she have lived through it? Perhaps one gets accustomed to doing it reflected Miss Madeline, but I am sure I never could. Did Mr. Thorne feel very badly, whispered Lena that night. I'm afraid he did, confessed Miss Madeline sorrowfully. He looked so pale and sad, Lena, that my heart ached for him. I am very thankful that I have never had any other proposals to decline. It is a very unpleasant experience. But, she added, with a little tinge of satisfaction in a sweet voice, I am glad I had one. It, it has made me feel more like other people. You know, dear? Robert Turner's Revenge When Robert Turner came to the green, ferny triangle, where the station road forked to the right and left, under the birches. He hesitated as to which direction he would take. The left led out to the old Turner homestead, where he had spent his boyhood and where his cousin still lived. The right led down to the cove shore, where the Jameson property was situated. Since he had stopped off at Chiswick, for the purpose of looking this property over before foreclosing the mortgage on it. He concluded that he might as well take the cove road. He could go around by the shore afterward. He had not forgotten the way even in forty years, and so on up through the old spruce wood in Alec Martin's field. If the spruces were there still, and the field still Alec Martin's, to his cousin's place. He would just about have time to make the round before the early country supper hour. Then a brief visit with Tom. Tom had always been a good sort of a fellow, although woefully dull and slow going, and the evening express for Montreal. He swung with a business-like stride into the cove road. As he went on, however, the stride insensibly slackened into an unaccustomed saunter. How well he remembered that old road, although it was forty years since he had last traversed it. A set-lipped boy of fifteen, cast on the world by the indifference of an uncle. The years had made surprisingly little difference in it or in the surrounding scenery. True, the hills and fields and lanes seemed lower and smaller and narrower than he remembered them. There were some new houses along the road, and the belt of woods along the back of the farms had become thinner in most places. But that was all. He had no difficulty in picking out the old familiar spots. There was the big cherry orchard on the Milligan Place, 
which had been so famous in his boyhood. It was snow white with blossoms, as if the trees were possessed of eternal youth. They had been in blossom the last time he had seen them. Well, time had not stood still with him as it had with Luke Milligan's cherry orchard, he reflected grimly. His springtime had long gone by. The few people he met on the road looked at him curiously, for strangers were not commonplace in Chiswick. He recognized some of the older among them, but none of them knew him. He had been an awkward, long-limbed lad, with fresh boyish color and crisp black curls when he had left Chiswick. He returned to it a somewhat portly figure of a man, with close cropped, grizzled hair, and a face that looked as if it might be carved out of granite. So immobile and unyielding it was. In the face of a man who never faltered, or wavered, who stuck at nothing that might advance his plans and purposes. A face known and dreaded in the business world where he reigned master. It was a cold, hard, selfish face. But the face of the boy of forty years ago had been neither cold nor hard nor selfish. Presently the homesteads and orchard lands grew fewer and then ceased altogether. The fields were long and low-lying, sloping down to the misty blue rim of sea. A turn of the road brought him in sudden sight of the cove, and there below him was the old Jameson homestead, built almost within wave lap of the pebbly shore, and shut away into a lonely gray world of its own, by the sea and sands, and those long slopes of tenantless fields. He paused at the sagging gate, that opened into the long, deep-rutted lane, and, folding his arms on it, looked earnestly and scrutinizingly over the buildings. They were gray and faded, lacking the prosperous appearance that had characterized them once. There was an air of failure about the whole place, as if the very land had become disheartened and discouraged. Long ago, Neil Jameson, Sr., had been a well-to-do man. And the Big Cove Farm had been one of the best in Chiswick then. As for Neil Jameson Jr., Robert Turner's face always grew something grimmer when he recalled him. The one person, boy and man, whom he had really hated in the world. They had been enemies from childhood, and once in a bout of wrestling at the Chiswick School, Neil had thrown him by an unfair trick and taunted him continually thereafter on his defeat. Robert had made a compact with himself that some day he would pay Neil Jameson back. He had not forgotten it. He never forgot such things. But he had never seen or heard of Neil Jameson after leaving Chiswick. He might have been dead for anything Robert Turner knew. Then, when John Kesley failed, and his effects turned over to his creditors, of whom Robert Turner was the chief, a mortgage on the coal farm at Chiswick, owned by Neil Jameson, had been found among his assets. Inquiry revealed the fact that Neil Jameson was dead, and that the farm was run by his widow. Turner felt a pang of disappointment. What satisfaction was there in wreaking revenge on a dead man? But at least his wife and children should suffer. That debt of his to Jameson for an ill-won victory, and many a sneer must be paid in full. If not to him, why, then to his heirs. His lawyers reported 
that Mrs. Jameson was two years behind with her interest. Turner instructed them to foreclose the mortgage promptly, and then he took it into his head to revisit Jessic and have a good look at the coal farm and other places he knew so well. He had a notion that it might be a decent place to spend a summer month or two in. His wife went to seaside and mountain resorts, but he liked something quieter. There was good fishing at the cove and in Chiswick Pond, as he remembered. If he liked the farm as well as his memory promised him he would do, he would bid it in himself. It would make Neil Jameson turn in his grave. If the penniless lad he had cheered at came into the possession of his old ancestral property that had been owned by a Jameson for over one hundred years. And there was a flavor in such a revenge that pleased Robert Turner. He smiled one of his occasional grim smiles over it. When Robert Turner smiled, weather prophets of the business guy foretold squalls. Presently he opened the gate and went through. Halfway down the lane forked, one branch going over to the house the other slanting across the field to the cove. Turner took the latter and soon found himself on the grey shore where the waves were tumbling in creamy foam, just as he remembered them long ago. Nothing about the old cove had changed. He walked around a knobby headland, weather-worn with the wind and spray of years which cut him off from sight of the Jameson house, and sat down on a rock. He thought to himself alone, and was annoyed to find a boy sitting on the opposite ledge with a book on his knee. The lad lifted his eyes and looked Turner over with a clear, direct gaze. He was about twelve years old, tall for his age, slight, with a delicate, clear-cut face a face that was oddly familiar to Turner, although he was sure he had never seen it before. The boy had oval cheeks, finely tinted with color, big, shy blue eyes, quilled about with long black lashes, and silvery golden hair, lying over his head in soft ringlets like a girl's. What girl's? Something far back in Robert Turner's dreamlike boyhood seemed to call to him, like a note of a forgotten melody, sweet yet stirring like a pain. The more he looked at the boy, the stronger the impression of a resemblance grew in every feature but the mouth. That was alien to his recollection of the face, yet there was something about it, when taken by itself, that seemed oddly familiar also. Yes, and unpleasantly familiar, although the mouth was a good one, finely cut and possessing more firmness than was found in all the other features put together. It's a good place for reading, Sonny, isn't it? he inquired more genially than he had spoken to a child for years. In fact, having no children of his own, he so seldom spoke to a child, that his voice and manner when he did so were generally awkward and rusty. The boy nodded a quick little nod. Somehow Turner had expected that nod and the glimmer of a smile that accompanied it. What book are you reading? he asked. The boy held it out. It was an old Robinson Crusoe, that classic of boyhood. It's splendid, he said. Billy Martin lent it to me, and I have to finish it today, because Ned Josephs is to have it next, and he's in a hurry for it. It's a good while since I read Robinson Crusoe, said Turner reflectively. 
But when I did, it was on this very shore, a little further along below the Miller place. There was a Martin and a Joseph's in the partnership then too. The fathers, I dare say, of Billy and Ned. What is your name, my boy? Paul Jameson, sir. The name was a shock to Turner. This boy, a Jameson. Neil Jameson's son. Why, yes, he had Neil's mouth. Strange he had nothing else in common with the black-browed, black-haired Jameson. What business had a Jameson with those blue eyes and silvery golden curls? It was flagrant forgery on nature's part to fashion such things and label them Jameson by a mouth. Hated Neil Jameson's son, Robert Turner's face grew so grey and hard that the boy involuntarily glanced upward to see if a cloud had crossed the sun. Your father was Neil Jameson, I suppose, Turner said abruptly. Paul nodded. Yes, but he is dead. He has been dead for eight years. I don't remember him. Have you any brothers or sisters? I have a little sister a year younger than I am. The other four are dead. They died long ago. I'm the only boy mother had. Oh, I do so wish I was bigger and older. If I was, I could do something to save the place. I'm sure I could. It is breaking mother's heart to have to leave it. So she has to leave it, has she? said Turner grimly, with the old hatred stirring in his heart. Yes, there is a mortgage on it, and we are to be sold out very soon. So the lawyers told us. Mother has tried so hard to make the farm pay, but she couldn't. I could if I was bigger. I know I could. If they would only wait a few years. But there is no use hoping for that. Mother cries all the time about it. She has lived at the Cove farm for over thirty years, and she says she can't live away from it now. Elise... That's my sister, and I do all we can to cheer her up. But we can't do much. Oh, if I was only a man. The lad shut his lips together. How much his mouth was like his father's, and looked out seaward with troubled blue eyes. Turner smiled another grim smile. Oh, Neil Jameson. Your old score was being paid now. Yet something embittered the sweetness of revenge. That boy's face. He could not hate it, as he had accustomed himself to hate the memory of Neil Jameson, and all connected with him. What was your mother's name before she married your father? He demanded abruptly. Lisbeth Miller answered the boy, still frowning seaward over his secret thoughts. Turner started again. Lisbeth Miller? He might have known it. What woman in all the world, save Lisbeth Miller, could have given her son those eyes and curls? So, Lisbeth had married Neil Jameson. Little Lisbeth Miller, his schoolboy sweetheart. He had forgotten her, or thought he had. Certainly he had not thought of her for years. But the memory of her came back, now with a rush. Little Lisbeth, pretty little Lisbeth. Merry little Lisbeth. How clearly he remembered her. The old Miller place had adjoined his uncle's farm. Lisbeth and he had played together from babyhood. How he had worshipped her. When they were six years old, they had solemnly promised to marry each other when they grew up. And Lisbeth had let him kiss her as earnest of their compact, made 
under a bloom white apple tree in the Miller orchard. Yet she would always blush furiously and deny it ever afterwards. It made her angry to be reminded of it. He saw himself going to school, carrying her books for her, the envied of all the boys. He remembered how he had fought Tony Josephs because Tony had the presumption to bring her spice apples. He had thrashed him too, so soundly that from that time forth none of the schoolboys presumed to rival him in Lisbeth's affections. Roguish little Lisbeth who grew prettier and saucier every year. He recalled the keen competition of the old days, when to be head of the class seemed the highest honor within mortal reach, and was driven after with might and main. He had seldom attained to it, because he would never go up past Lisbeth. If she missed a word, he, Robert, missed it too, no matter how well he knew it. It was sweet to be thought a dunce for her dear sake. It was all the reward he asked, to see her holding her place at the head of the class, her cheeks flushed pink and her eyes starry with her pride of position, and how sweetly she would lecture him on the way home from school about learning his spellings better, and wind up her sermon with the frank avowal, uttered with deliciously downcast lids, that she liked him better than any of the other boys after all, even if he couldn't spell as well as they could. Nothing of success that he had won since had ever thrilled him as that admission of little Lisbeth. She had been such a little sympathetic sweetheart too, never weary of listening to his dreams and ambitions, his plans for the future. She had always assured him that she knew he would succeed. Well, he had succeeded. And now one of the uses he was going to make of his success was to turn Lisbeth and her children out of the home by way of squaring matters with a dead man. Elizabeth had been away from home on a long visit to an aunt when he had left Jessic. She was growing up and the childish intimacy was fading. Perhaps, under other circumstances, it might have ripened into fruit. But he had gone away and forgotten her. The world had claimed him. He had lost all active remembrance of Lisbeth, and before this late return to Chiswick, he had not even known if she were living. And she was Neil Jameson's widow. He was silent for a long time, while the waves purred about the base of the big red sandstone rock, and the boy returned to his crusoe. Finally, Robert Turner roused himself from his reverie. I used to know your mother long ago, when she was a little girl, he said. I wonder if she remembers me. Ask her when you go home if she remembers Bobby Turner. Won't you come up to the house and see her, sir? asked Paul politely. Mother is always glad to see her old friends. No, I haven't time today. Robert Turner was not going to tell Neil Jamison's son that he did not care to look for the little Lisbeth of long ago in Neil Jamison's widow. The name spoiled her for him, just as the Jamison mouth spoiled her son for him. But you may tell her something else. The mortgage will not be foreclosed. I was the power behind the lawyers, but I did not know that the present owner of the Cove farm was my little playmate, Lisbeth Miller. You and she shall have all the time you want. Tell her Bobby Turner does this in return for what she gave him under the big sweeting apple tree on her sixth 
birthday. I think she will remember and understand. As for you, Paul, be a good boy and good to your mother. I hope you'll succeed in your ambition of making the farm pay when you are old enough to take it in hand. At any rate, you'll not be disturbed in your possession of it. Oh, sir, oh, sir, stammered Paul in an agony of embarrassing gratitude and delight. Oh, it seems too good to be true. Do you really mean that we are not to be sold out? Oh, won't you come up and tell Mother yourself? She'll be so happy, so grateful. Do come and let her thank you. Not today. I haven't time. Give her my message, that's all. There, run. The sooner she gets the news, the better. Turner watched the boy as he bounded away, until the headland hid him from sight. There goes my revenge, and a fine bit of property eminently suited for a summer residence. All for a bit of old, rusty sentiment, he said with a shrug. I didn't suppose I was capable of such a mood, but then, little Lisbeth. There never was a sweeter girl. I'm glad I didn't go with the boy to see her. She's an old woman now, and Neil Jameson's widow. I prefer to keep my old memories of her undisturbed. Little Lisbeth of the silvery golden curls and the roguish blue eyes. Little Lisbeth of the old time. I'm glad to be able to have done you the small service of securing your home to you. It is my thanks to you for the friendship and affection you gave my lonely boyhood, my tribute to the memory of my first sweetheart. He walked away with a smile, whose amusement presently softened to an expression that would have amazed his business cronies. Later on, he hummed the air of an old love song as he climbed the steep spruce road to Tom's. The Gossip of Valley View It was the first of April, and Julius Barrett, aged fourteen, perched on his father's gatepost, watched ruefully the low descending sun and counted that day lost. He had not succeeded in fooling a single person, although he had tried repeatedly. One and all, old and young, of his intended victims had been too wary for Julius. Hence, Julius was disgusted and ready for anything in the way of a stratagem or a spoil. The Barrett gatepost topped the highest hill in Valley View. Julius could see the entire settlement. From young Thomas Everett's farm, a mile to the west, to Adelia Williams' weather grey little house on the moonrise slope to the east. He was gazing moodily down the muddy road when Dan Chester, homeward bound from the post office, came riding sloppily along on his grey mare and pulled up by the Barrett gate to hand a paper to Julius. Dan was a young man who took life and himself very seriously. He seldom smiled, never joked, and had a Washingtonian reputation for veracity. Dan had never told a conscious falsehood in his life. He never even exaggerated. Julius, beholding Dan's solemn face, was seized with a perfectly irresistible desire to fool him. At the same moment his eye caught the dazzling reflection of the setting sun on the windows of Adelia Williams's house, and he had an inspiration little short of diabolical. Have you heard the news, Dan? he asked. No. What is it? 
asked Dan. I don't know, so I ought to tell it, said Julius reflectively. It's kind of a family affair, but then Adelia didn't say not to. And anyway, it'll be all over the place soon. So, I'll tell you, Dan, if you'll promise never to tell who told you. Adelia Williams and young Thomas Everett are going to be married. Julius delivered himself of this tremendous lie with a transparently earnest countenance. Yet Dan, credulous as he was, could not believe it all at once. Get out, he said. It's true, upon my word, protested Julius. Adelia was up last night and told Ma all about it. Ma's her cousin, you know. The wedding is to be in June, and Adelia asked Ma to help her get her quilts and things ready. Julius reeled all this off so glibly that Dan finally believed the story. Despite the fact that the people thus coupled together in prospective matrimony were the very last people in Valley View who could have been expected to marry each other. Young Thomas was a confirmed bachelor of fifty, and Adelia Williams was forty. They were not supposed to be even well acquainted, as the Everetts and the Williamses had never been very friendly, although no open feud existed between them. Nevertheless, in view of Julius's circumstantial statements, the amazing news must be true, and Dan was instantly agog to carry it further. Julius watched Dan and the grey mare out of sight, fairly writhing with ecstasy. Oh, but Dan had been easy. The story would be all over Valley View in 24 hours. Julius laughed until he came near to falling off the gatepost. At this point, Julius and Danny drop out of our story, and young Thomas enters. It was two days later when young Thomas heard that he was to be married to Adelia Williams in June. Eben Clark, the blacksmith, told him when he went to the forge to get his horse shot. Young Thomas laughed his big jolly laugh. Valley View gossip had been marrying him off for the last thirty years. Although never before to Adelia Williams. It's news to me, he said tolerantly. Eben grinned broadly. Ah, you can't buff it off like that, Tom he said. The news came too straight this time. Well, I was glad to hear it, although I was mighty surprised. I never thought of you and Adelia. But she's a fine little woman, and will make you a capital wife. Young Thomas grunted and drove away. He had a good deal of business to do that day, involving calls at various places the store for molasses, the mill for flour, Jim Bentley's for seed grain, the doctor's for toothache drops for his housekeeper, the post office for mail, and at each and every place he was joked about his approaching marriage. In the end, it rather annoyed young Thomas. He drove home at last in what was for him something of a temper. How on earth had that fool story started, with such detailed circumstantiality of rugs and quilts too? Adelia Williams must be going to marry somebody, and the Valley View gossip, unable to locate the man, had guessed young Thomas. When he reached home, tired, mud bespattered, and hungry, his housekeeper, who was also his hired man's wife, 
asked him if it was true that he was going to be married. Young Thomas, taking in at a glance the ill-prepared, half-cold supper on the table, felt more annoyed than ever, and said it wasn't, with a strong expression, not quite an oath, for young Thomas never swore, unless swearing was as much a matter of intonation as of words. Mrs. Dunn sighed, patted her swelled face, and said she was sorry. She had hoped it was true, for her man had decided to go west. They were to go in a month's time. Young Thomas sat down to his supper, with the prospect of having to look up another housekeeper and hired man before planting to destroy his appetite. Next day, three people who came to see young Thomas on business congratulated him on his approaching marriage. Young Thomas, who had recovered his usual good humor, merely laughed. There was no use in being too earnest in denial, he thought. He knew that his unusual fit of petulance with his housekeeper had only convinced her that the story was true. It would die away in time, as other similar stories had died, he thought. Valley View gossip was imaginative. Young Thomas looked rather serious, however, when the minister and his wife called that evening and referred to the report. Young Thomas gravely said that it was unfounded. The minister looked graver still and said he was sorry. He had hoped it was true. His wife glanced significantly about young Thomas's big, untidy sitting room, where there were cobwebs on the ceiling, and fluff in the corners, and dust on the mop board, and said nothing, but looked volumes. Dang it all, said young Thomas as they drove away. They'll marry me yet in spite of myself. The gossip made him think about Adelia Williams. He had never thought about her before. He was barely acquainted with her. Now he remembered that she was a plump, jolly-looking little woman, noted for being a good housekeeper. Then young Thomas groaned, remembering that he must start out looking for a housekeeper soon, and housekeepers were not easily found as young Thomas had discovered several times since his mother's death ten years before. Next Sunday, in church, young Thomas looked at Adelia Williams. He caught Adelia looking at him. Adelia blushed and looked guiltily away. Dang it all, reflected young Thomas, forgetting that he was in church. I suppose she has heard that fool story too. I'd like to know the person who started it, man or woman. I'd punch their head. Nevertheless, young Thomas went on looking at Adelia by fits and starts. Although he did not again catch Adelia looking at him, he noticed that she had round rosy cheeks and twinkling brown eyes. She did not look like an old maid, and young Thomas wondered that she had been allowed to become one. Sarah Barnett, now, to whom report had married him a year ago, looked like a dried sour apple. For the next four weeks, the story haunted young Thomas like a specter. Down it would not. Everywhere he went, he was choked about it. It gathered fresh detail every week. Adelia was getting her clothes ready. She was to be married in seal-brown cashmere. Vinnie Lawrence at the Valley Center was making it for her. She had got a new hat with a long ostrich plume. Some said white, some said gray. Young Thomas kept wondering who the man could be, for he was convinced that Adelia was going to marry somebody. More than that, once he caught himself wondering enviously. Adelia was a nice-looking woman, and he had not 
so far heard of any probable housekeeper. Dang it all, said young Thomas to himself in desperation. I wouldn't care if it was true. His married sister from Carlisle heard the story and came over to investigate. Young Thomas denied it shortly, and his sister scolded. She had devoutly hoped it was true, she said, and it would have been a great weight off her mind. This house is in a disgraceful condition, Thomas, she said severely. It would break Mother's heart if she could rise out of her grave to see it. And Adelia Williams is a perfect housekeeper. You didn't use to think so much of the Williams crowd, said young Thomas dryly. Oh, some of them don't amount to much, admitted Maria. But Adelia is all right. Catching sight of an odd look on young Thomas's face, she added hastily, Thomas Everett, I believe it's true after all. Now, is it? For mercy's sake, don't be so sly. You might tell me, your own and only sister, if it is. Oh, shut up, was young Thomas's unfeeling reply to his own and only sister. Young Thomas told himself that night that Valley View gossip would drive him into an asylum yet if it didn't let up. He also wondered if Adelia was as much persecuted as himself. No doubt she was. He never could catch her eye in church now, but he would have been surprised had he realized how many times he tried to. The climax came the third week in May, when young Thomas, who had been keeping house for himself for three weeks, received a letter and an express box from his cousin, Charles Everett, out of Manitoba. Charles and he had been chums in their boyhood, and they corresponded occasionally still, although it was twenty years since Charles had gone west. The letter was to congratulate young Thomas on his approaching marriage. Charles had heard of it through some Valley View correspondence of his wife. He was much pleased. He had always liked Adelia, he said, had been an old beau of hers, in fact. Thomas might give her a kiss for him, if he liked. He forwarded a wedding present by express, and hoped they would be very happy, etc., the present was an elaborate hat-rack of polished buffalo horns, mounted on red plush, with an inset mirror. Young Thomas set it up on the kitchen table, and scowled moodily at his reflection in the mirror. If wedding presents were beginning to come, it was high time something was done. The matter was past being a joke. This affair of the present would certainly get out. Things always got out in Valley View, dang it all, and he would never hear the last of it. I'll marry, said young Thomas decisively. If Adelia Williams won't have me, I'll marry the first woman who will, if it's Sarah Barnett herself. Young Thomas shaved and put on his Sunday suit. As soon as it was safely dark, he hied himself away to Adelia Williams. He felt very doubtful about his reception, but the remembrance of the twinkle in Adelia's brown eyes comforted him. She looked like a woman who had a sense of humor. She might not take him, but she would not feel offended or insulted because he asked her. Dang it all, though, I hope she will take me said young Thomas. I am in for getting married now, and no mistake. And I can't get Adelia out of my head. I've been thinking of her steady ever since that confounded gossip began. When he knocked at Adelia's door, he discovered that his face was wet with perspiration. Adelia opened the door and started when she saw him. Then she turned very red, 
and stiffly asked him in. Young Thomas went in and sat down, wondering if all men felt so horribly uncomfortable when they went courting. Adelia stooped low over the wood box to put a stick of wood in the stove, for the May evening was chilly. Her shoulders were shaking, and the shaking grew worse. Suddenly Adelia laughed hysterically, and, sitting down on the wood box, continued to laugh. Young Thomas eyed her with a friendly grin. Oh, do excuse me, gasped poor Adelia, wiping tears from her eyes. This is dreadful. I didn't mean to laugh. I don't know why I'm laughing, but I can't help it. She laughed helplessly again. Young Thomas laughed too. His embarrassment vanished in the mellowness of that laughter. Presently, Adelia composed herself and removed from the wood box to a chair. But there was still a suspicious twitching about the corners of her mouth. I suppose, said young Thomas, determined to have it over with before the ice could form again. I suppose, Adelia, you've heard the story that's been going about you and me of late. Adelia nodded. I've been persecuted to the verge of insanity with it, she said. Every soul I've seen has tormented me about it, and people have written me about it. I've denied it till I was black in the face, but nobody believed me. I can't find out how it started. I hope you believe, Mr. Everett, that it couldn't possibly have arisen from anything I said. I felt dreadfully worried for fear you might think it did. I heard that my cousin, Lucilia Barrett, said I told her, but Lucilia vowed to me that she never said such a thing or even dreamed of it. I felt dreadfully bad over the whole affair. I even gave up the idea of making a quilt after a lovely new pattern I've got, because they made such a talk about my brown dress. I've been kind of supposing that you must be going to marry somebody, and folks just guessed it was me, said young Thomas. He said it anxiously. No, I'm not going to be married to anybody, said Adelia with a laugh, taking up her knitting. I'm glad of that, said young Thomas gravely. I mean, he hastened to add, seeing the look of astonishment on Adelia's face, that I am glad there isn't any other man, because... Because I want you myself, Adelia. Adelia laid down her knitting and blushed crimson, but she looked at young Thomas squarely and reproachfully. You needn't think you're bound to say that because of the gossip, Mr. Everett, she said quietly. Oh, I don't, said young Thomas earnestly. But the truth is, the story set me to thinking about you, and from that I got to wishing it was true. Honest, I did. I couldn't get you out of my head, and at last I didn't want to. It just seemed to me that you were the very woman for me if you'd only take me. Will you, Adelia? I've got a good farm and house. And... I'll try to make you happy. It was not a very romantic wooing, perhaps, but Adelia was forty and had never been a romantic little body, even in the heyday of youth. She was a practical woman, and young Thomas was a fine-looking man of his age, with abundance of worldly goods. Besides, she liked him and the gossip had made her think a good deal about him of late. Indeed, in a moment of candor, she had owned to herself the very last Sunday in church that she wouldn't mind if the story were true. I'll... 
I'll think of it, she said. This was practically an acceptance, and young Thomas so understood it. Without loss of time, he crossed the kitchen, sat down beside Adelia, and put his arms about her plump waist. Here's a kiss Charlie sent me to give you, he said, giving it. Penelope's Party Waste It's perfectly horrid to be so poor, grumbled Penelope. Penelope did not often grumble, but just now, as she sat tapping with one pink-tipped finger in her invitation to Blanche Anderson's party, she felt that grumbling was the only relief she had. Penelope was seventeen. And when one is seventeen and cannot go to a party because one hasn't a suitable dress to wear, the world is very apt to seem a howling wilderness. I wish I could think of some way to get you a new waist, said Doris, with what these sisters called the poverty pucker coming in the center of a pretty forehead. If your black skirt were sponged and pressed and rehung, it would do very well. Penelope saw the poverty pucker, and immediately repented with all her impetuous heart, having grumbled. That pucker came often enough without being brought there by extra worries. Well, there is no use sitting here sighing for the unattainable, she said, jumping up briskly. I'd better be putting my grey matter into that algebra instead of wasting it plodding for a party dress that I certainly can't get. It's a sad thing for a body to lack brains when she wants to be a teacher, isn't it? If I could only absorb algebra and history as I can music, what a blessing it would be. Come now, Dory dear, smooth that pucker out. Next year I shall be earning a princely salary, which we can squander on party gowns at well. If people haven't given up inviting us by that time, in sheer despair of ever being able to conquer our exclusiveness. Penelope went off to her detested algebra with a laugh, but the pucker did not go out of Doris's forehead. She wanted Penelope to go to that party. Penelope has studied so hard all winter, and she hasn't gone anywhere, thought the older sister wistfully. She is getting discouraged over those examinations, and she needs just a good, jolly time to hearten her up. If it could only be managed. But Doris did not see how it could. It took every cent of a small salary as typewriter in an uptown office to run their tiny establishment and keep Penelope in school dresses and books. Indeed, she could not have done even that much if they had not owned their little cottage. Next year it would be easier if Penelope got through her examination successfully, but just now there was absolutely not a spare penny. It is hard to be poor. We are a pair of misfits, said Doris, with a patient little smile, thinking of Penelope's uncultivated talent for music, and her own housewifely gifts, which had small chance of flowering out in her business life. Doris dreamed of pretty dresses all that night, and thought about them all the next day. So, it must be confessed, did Penelope, though she would not have admitted it for the world. When Doris reached home the next evening, she found Penelope hovering over a bulky parcel on the sitting room table. I am so glad you've come, she said with an exaggerated gasp of relief. I really don't think my curiosity could have borne the strain for another five minutes. The expressman brought this parcel an hour ago, 
and there's a letter for you from Aunt Adela on the clock shelf, and I think they belong to each other. Hurry up and find out. Dory, darling, what if it should be a... a present of some sort or other? I suppose it can't be anything else, smiled Doris. She knew that Penelope had started out to say, A new dress. She cut the strings and removed the wrappings. Both girls stared. It is, isn't it? Yes, it is. Doris Hunter, I believe it's an old quilt. Doris unfolded the odd present with a queer feeling of disappointment. She did not know just what she had expected the package to contain, but certainly not this. She laughed a little shakily. Well, we can't say after this that Aunt Adela never gave us anything, she said, when she had opened her letter. Listen, Penelope. My dear Doris, I have decided to give up housekeeping and go out west to live with Robert. So I am disposing of such of the family heirlooms as I do not wish to take with me. I am sending you by express your grandmother Hunter's silk quilt. It is a handsome article still, and I hope you will prize it, as you should. It took your grandmother five years to make it. There is a bit of the wedding dress of every member of the family in it. Love to Penelope and yourself, your affectionate aunt, Adela Hunter. I don't see its beauty, said Penelope with a grimace. It may have been pretty once, but it is all faded now. It is a monument of patience, though. The pattern is what they call little thousands, isn't it? Tell me, Dory, does it argue a lack of proper respect for my ancestors that I can't feel very enthusiastic over this heirloom, especially when Grandmother Hunter died years before I was born? It was very kind of Aunt Adela to send it, said Doris dutifully. Oh, very, agreed Penelope trolley. Only don't ever ask me to sleep under it. It would give me the nightmare. Oh, oh! This last was a little squeal of admiration as Doris turned the quilt over and brought to view the shimmering lining. Why, the wrong side is ever so much prettier than the right, exclaimed Penelope. What lovely old-time stuff, and not a bit faded. The lining was certainly very pretty. It was a soft, creamy yellow silk, with a design of brocaded pink rosebuds all over it. That was a dress Grandmother Hunter had when she was a girl, said Doris absently. I remember hearing Aunt Adela speak of it. When it became old-fashioned, Grandmother used it to line her quilt. I declare it is as good as new. Well, let us go and have tea, said Penelope. I'm decidedly hungry. Besides, I see the poverty pucker coming. Put the quilt in the spare room. It is something to possess an heirloom after all. It gives one a nice, important family feeling. After tea, when Penelope was patiently grinding away at her studies, and thinking dolefully enough of the near approaching examinations, which she had dreaded, and of teaching, which she confidently expected to hate, Doris went up to the tiny spare room to look at the wrong side of the quilt again. It would make the loveliest party waste, she said under her breath. Creamy yellow is Penelope's color, and I could use that bit of old black lace and those knots of velvet ribbon that I have to trim it. I wonder if Grandmother Hunter's reproachful spirit will forever haunt me if I do it. And Doris knew very well that she would do it. I had known it ever since she had looked at that lovely lining 
and a vision of Penelope's vivid face and red-brown hair rising above a waist of the quaint old silk had flashed before her mental sight. That night, after Penelope had gone to bed, Doris ripped the lining out of Grandmother Hunter's silk quilt. If Aunt Adela saw me now, she laughed softly to herself as she worked. In the three following evenings, Doris made the waste. She thought it a wonderful bit of good luck that Penelope went out each of the evenings to study some especially difficult problems with a school chum. It would be such a nice surprise for her, her sister mused jubilantly. Penelope was surprised as much as the tender, sisterly heart could wish when Doris flashed out upon her triumphantly on the evening of the party, with the black skirt nicely pressed and rehung, and the prettiest waist imaginable, a waist that was a positive creation of dainty, rose-besprinkled silk, with a girdle and knots of black velvet. Doris Hunter, you are a veritable little witch, do you mean to tell me that you conjured that perfectly lovely thing for me out of the lining of Grandmother Hunter's quilt? So Penelope went to Blanche's party, and her dress was the admiration of every girl there. Mrs. Fairweather, who was visiting Mrs. Anderson, looked closely at it also. She was a very sweet old lady, with silver hair, which she wore in delightful, old-fashioned puffs, and she had very bright, dark eyes. Penelope thought her altogether charming. She looks as if she had just stepped out of the frame of some lovely old picture, she said to herself. I wish she belonged to me. I'd just love to have a grandmother like her, and I do wonder who it is I've seen who looks so much like her. A little later on, the knowledge came to her suddenly, and she thought with inward surprise. Why, it is Doris, of course. My sister Doris lives to be seventy years old and wears her hair in pretty white puffs. She will look exactly as Mrs. Fairweather does now. Mrs. Fairweather asked to have Penelope introduced to her, and when they found themselves alone together, she said gently, My dear, I am going to ask a very impertinent question. Will you tell me where you got the silk of which your waist is made? Poor Penelope's pretty young face turned crimson. She was not troubled with false pride by any means, but she simply could not bring herself to tell Mrs. Fairweather that her waist was made out of the lining of an old heirloom quilt. My Aunt Adela gave me, gave us, the material, she stammered. And my elder sister Doris made the waist for me. I think the silk ones belonged to my grandmother Hunter. What was your grandmother's maiden name? asked Mrs. Fairweather eagerly. Penelope Saverne. I am named after her. Mrs. Fairweather suddenly put her arm about Penelope and drew the young girl to her, her lovely old face aglow with delight and tenderness. Then you are my grandniece, she said. Your grandmother was my half-sister. When I saw your dress, I felt sure you were related to her. I should recognize that rosebud silk if I came across it in Tibet. Penelope Saverne was the daughter of my mother by her first husband. Penelope was four years older than I was, but we were devoted to each other. Oddly enough, our birthdays fell on the same day, and when Penelope was twenty and I sixteen, my father gave us each a silk dress of this very material. I have mine yet. Soon after this, our mother died, and our household was broken up. Penelope went to live with her aunt, and I went west with father. This was long ago, you know. 
when traveling and correspondence were not the easy, matter-of-course things they are now. After a few years, I lost touch with my half-sister. I married out west and have lived there all my life. I never knew what had become of Penelope. But tonight, when I saw you come in, in that waist made of the rosebud silk, the whole past rose before me, and I felt like a girl again. My dear, I am a very lonely old woman, with nobody belonging to me. You don't know how delighted I am to find that I have two grandnieces. Penelope had listened silently. Like a girl in a dream. Now she patted Mrs. Fairweather's soft old hand affectionately. It sounds like a storybook, she said gaily. You must come and see Doris. She is such a darling sister. I wouldn't have had this waste if it hadn't been for her. I will tell you the whole truth. I don't mind it now. Doris made my party waste for me out of the lining of an old silk quilt of Grandmother Hunter's that Aunt Adela sent us. Mrs. Fairweather did go to see Doris the very next day, and quite wonderful things came to pass from that interview. Doris and Penelope found their lives and plans changed in the twinkling of an eye. They were both to go and live with Aunt Esther, as Mrs. Fairweather had said they must call her. Penelope was to have, at last, her longed for musical education, and Doris was to be the home girl. You must take the place of my own dear little granddaughter, said Aunt Esther. She died six years ago, and I have been so lonely since. When Mrs. Fairweather had gone, Doris and Penelope looked at each other. Pinch me, please, said Penelope. I'm half afraid I'll wake up and find I have been dreaming. Isn't it all wonderful, Doris Hunter? Doris nodded radiantly. Oh, Penelope, think of it. Music for you. Somebody to pet and fuss over for me. And such a dear, sweet auntie for us both. And no more contriving party wastes out of old silk linings, laughed Penelope. But it was very fortunate that you did it for once, sister mine, and no more poverty puckers, she concluded. Miss Sally's Company How beautiful, said Mary Seymour delightedly, as they dismounted from the wheels on the crest of the hill. Ida, who could have supposed that such a view would be our reward for climbing that long, tedious hill with its ruts and stones? Don't you feel repaid? Yes, but I am dreadfully thirsty, said Ida who was always practical and never as enthusiastic over anything as Mary was. Yet she, too, felt a keen pleasure in the beauty of the scene before them. Almost at their feet lay the sea, creaming and shimmering in the mellow sunshine. Beyond, on either hand, stretched rugged brown cliffs and rocks, here running out to sea in misty purple headlands. There, curving into bays and coves that seemed filled up with sunlight and glamour and pearly hazes. A beautiful shore, and seemingly a lonely one. The only house visible from where the girls stood was a tiny grey one, with odd, low eaves and big chimneys that stood down in the little valley on their right where the cliffs broke away to let a brook run out to sea, and formed a small cove, on whose sandy shore the waves lapped and crooned within a stone's throw of the house. On either side of the cove a headland made out to sea, curving around to enclose the sparkling water, as in a cup. What a picturesque spot, said Mary. But what a lonely one, protested Ida. Why, there isn't another house in sight. 
I wonder who lives in it. Anyway, I'm going down to ask them for a drink of water. I'd like to ask for a square meal too, said Mary, laughing. I am discovering that I'm hungry. Fine scenery is very satisfying to the soul, to be sure, but it doesn't still the cravings of the inner girl. And if we've wheeled ten miles this afternoon, I'm getting hungrier every minute. They reached the little grey house by way of a sloping grassy lane. Everything about it was very neat and trim. In front, a whitewashed paling shut in the garden, which, sheltered as it was by the house, was ablaze with poppies and hollyhocks and geraniums. A path, bordered by big white clamshells, led through it to the front door, whose steps were slabs of smooth red sandstone from the beach. No children here, suddenly, whispered Ida. Every one of those clamshells is placed just so, and this walk is swept every day. No, we shall never dare to ask for anything to eat here. They would be afraid of scattering crumbs. Ida lifted a hand to knock, but before she could do so, the door was thrown open and a breathless little lady appeared on the threshold. She was very small, with an eager, delicately featured face and dark eyes twinkling behind her gold-rimmed glasses. She was dressed immaculately in an old-fashioned gown of grey silk, with a white muslin fichu crossed over her shoulders, and her silvery hair fell on each side of her face in long, smooth curls that just touched the shoulders and bobbed and fluttered with her every motion. Behind, it was caught up in a knot on her head and surmounted by a tiny lace cap. She looks as if she had just stepped out of a bandbox of last century, thought Mary. Are you Cousin Abner's girls? demanded the little lady eagerly. There was such excitement and expectation in her face and voice that both the Seymour girls felt uncomfortably that they ought to be Cousin Abner's girls. No, said Mary reluctantly. We are not. We are only Martin Seymour's girls. All the light went out of the little lady's face, as if some illuminating lamp had suddenly been quenched behind it. She seemed fairly to droop under her disappointment. As for the rest, the name of Martin Seymour evidently conveyed no special meaning to her ears. How could she know that he was a multi-millionaire who was popularly supposed to breakfast on railroads and lunch on small corporations, and that his daughters were girls whom all people delighted to honor? No, of course you are not Cousin Abner's girls, she said sorrowfully. I'd have known you couldn't be if I had just stopped to think because you are dark and they would be fair, of course. Cousin Abner and his wife were both fair, but when I saw you coming down the lane, I was peeking through the hall window upstairs, you know. I and Juliana, I was sure you were Helen and Beatrice at last, and I can't help wishing you were. I wish we were too, since you expected them, said Mary, smiling, but... Oh, I wasn't really expecting them, broke in the little lady. Only I am always hoping that they will come. They never have yet, but Trenton isn't so far away, and it is so lonely here. I just long for company, I and Juliana, and I thought I was going to have it today. Cousin Abner came to see me once since I moved here, and he said the girls would come too, but that was six months ago and they haven't come yet. But perhaps they will soon. It is always something to look forward to, you know? She talked in a sweet, chirpy voice like a bird's. There were pathetic notes in it, too, as the girls instinctively felt. How very quaint and sweet 
and unworldly she was. Mary found herself feeling indignant at Cousin Abner's girls, whoever they were, for their neglect. We were out for a spin on our wheels, said Ida, and we were very thirsty. We thought perhaps you would be kind enough to give us a drink of water. Oh, my dear, anything, anything I have is at your service, said the little lady delightedly. If you will come in, I will get you some lemonade. I'm afraid it is too much trouble, began Mary. Oh, no, no, cried the little lady. It is a pleasure. I love doing things for people. I wish more of them would come to give me the chance. I never have any company, and I do so long for it. It's very lonesome here at Golden Gate. Oh, if you would only stay to tea with me, it would make me so happy. I am all prepared. I prepare every Saturday morning, in particular, so that if Cousin Abner's girls did come, I would be all ready. And when nobody comes, Juliana and I have to eat everything up ourselves. And that is bad for us. It gives Juliana indigestion. If you would only stay. We will, agreed Ida promptly, and we are glad of the chance. We are both terribly hungry, and it is very good of you to ask us. Oh, indeed, isn't it? It's just selfishness in me, that's what it is, pure selfishness. I want company so much. Come in, my dears, and I suppose I must introduce myself, because you don't know me. Do you now? I am Miss Sally Temple, and this is Golden Gate Cottage. Dear me, this is something like living. You are special providences, that you are indeed. She whisked them through a quaint little parlor, where everything was as dainty and neat and old-fashioned as herself, and into a spare room beyond it, to put off their hats. Now, just excuse me a minute while I run out and tell Juliana that we are going to have company to tea. She will be so glad, Juliana will. Make yourselves at home, my dears. Isn't she delicious, said Mary, when Miss Sally had tripped out. I'd like to shake Cousin Abner's girls. This is what Dot Holiday would call an adventure, Ida. Isn't it? Miss Sally and this quaint old spot both seem like a chapter out of the novels our grandmothers cried over. Look here, Mary. She is lonely, and our visit seems like a treat to her. Let us try to make it one. Let's just chum with her and tell her all about ourselves, and our amusements, and our dresses. That sounds frivolous, but you know what I mean. She'll like it. Let's be company in real earnest for her. When Miss Sally came back, she was attended by Juliana carrying a tray of lemonade glasses. Juliana proved to be a diminutive lass of about fourteen whose cheerful, freckled face wore an expansive grin of pleasure. Evidently, Juliana was as fond of company as her mistress was. Afterwards, the girls overheard a subdued colloquy between Miss Sally and Juliana out in the hall. Go set the table, Juliana, and put on Grandmother Temple's wedding china. Be sure you dust it carefully, and the best tablecloth, and be sure you get the creases straight, and put some sweet peas in the center, and be sure they are fresh. I want everything extra nice, Juliana. Yes, Miss Sally, I'll see to it. Isn't it great to have company, Miss Sally? whispered Juliana. The Seymour girls long remembered that tea table and the delicacies with which it was heaped. Privately, they did not wonder that Juliana had indigestion when she had to eat many such unaided. Being hungry, they did full justice to Miss Sally's good things much to that little lady's delight. She told them all about herself. She had lived at Golden Gate Cottage only a year. 
Before that, I lived away down the country at Millbridge with a cousin. My uncle Ephraim owned Golden Gate Cottage, and when he died he left it to me, and I came here to live. It is a pretty place, isn't it? You see those two headlands out there? In the morning, when the sun rises, the water between them is just a sea of gold. And that is why Uncle Ephraim had a fancy to call his place Golden Gate. I love it here. It is so nice to have a home of my own. I would be quite content if I had more company. But I have you today, and perhaps Beatrice and Helen will come next week. So I've really a great deal to be thankful for. What is your cousin Abner's other name? asked Mary, with a vague recollection of hearing of Beatrice and Helen, somebody in Trenton. Reed Abner, Abimelech Reed, answered Miss Sally promptly. A. A. Reed, he signs himself now. He is very well to do, I'm told, and he carries on business in town. He was a very fine young man, my cousin Abner. I don't know his wife. Mary and Ida exchanged glances. Beatrice and Helen Reed. They knew them slightly as the daughters of a new rich family who were hangers-on of the old-fashioned society in Trenton. They were regarded as decidedly vulgar, and so far their efforts to gain an entry into the exclusive circle, where the Seymours and their like revolved, had not been very successful. I'm afraid Miss Sally will wait a long while before she sees Cousin Abner's girls, said Mary, when they had gone back to the parlor and Miss Sally had excused herself to superintend the washing of Grandmother Temple's wedding china. They probably look on her as a poor relation to be ignored altogether. Whereas, if they were only like her, Trenton society would have made a place for them long ago. The Seymour girls enjoyed that visit as much as Miss Sally did. She was eager to hear all about their girlish lives and amusements. They told her of their travels, of famous men and women they had seen, of parties they had attended, the dresses they wore, the little fads and hobbies of their set. All jumbled up together and all listened to eagerly by Miss Sally and also by Juliana, who was permitted to sit on the stairs out in the hall and so gather in the crumbs of this intellectual feast. Oh, you've been such pleasant company, said Miss Sally when the girls went away. Mary took the little lady's hand in hers and looked affectionately down into her face. Would you like it, you and Juliana, if we came out to see you often, and perhaps brought some of our friends with us? Oh, if you only would, breathed Miss Sally. Mary laughed, and, obeying a sudden impulse, bent and kissed Miss Sally's cheek. We'll come, then, she promised. Please look upon us as your steady company henceforth. The girls kept their word. Thereafter, nearly every Saturday of the summer, found them taking tea with Miss Sally at Golden Gate. Sometimes they came alone. Sometimes they brought other girls. It soon became a decided fad in their set to go to see Miss Sally. Everybody who met her loved her at sight. It was considered a special treat to be taken by the Seymours to Golden Gate. As for Miss Sally, her cup of happiness was almost full. She had company to her heart's content, and of the very kind she loved, bright, merry, fun-loving girls who devoured her dainties with a frank zest that delighted her, filled the quaint old rooms with laughter and life, and chattered to her of all their plans and frolics and hopes. And there was just one little cloud on Miss Sally's fair sky. If only Cousin Abner's girls would come, she once said wistfully to Mary. 
Nobody can quite take the place of one's own, you know. My heart yearns after them. Mary was very silent and thoughtful as she drove back to Trenton that night. Two days afterwards, she went to Mrs. Gardiner's lawn party. The Reed girls were there. They were tall, fair, handsome girls, somewhat too lavishly and pronouncedly dressed in expensive gowns and hats, and looking, as they felt, very much on the outside of things. They brightened and bridled, however, when Mrs. Gardiner brought Mary Seymour up and introduced her. If there was one thing on earth that the Reed girls longed for more than another, it was to get in with the Seymour girls. After Mary had chatted with them for a few minutes in a friendly way, she said, I think we have a mutual friend in Miss Sally Temple of Golden Gate, haven't we? I'm sure I've heard her speak of you. The Reed girls flushed. They did not care to have the rich Seymour girls know of their connection with that queer old cousin of their father's, who lived in that out-of-the-world spot up-country. She is a distant cousin of ours, said Beatrice carelessly, but we've never met her. Oh, how much you have missed, said Mary frankly. She is the sweetest and most charming little lady I have ever met, and I am proud to number her among my friends. Golden Gate is such an idyllic little spot, too. We go there so often that I fear Miss Sally will think we mean to outwear our welcome. We hope to have a visitors in town this winter. Well, goodbye for now. I'll tell Miss Sally I've met you. She will be pleased to hear about you. When Mary had gone, the Reed girls looked at each other. I suppose we ought to have gone to see Cousin Sally before, said Beatrice. Father said we ought to. How on earth did the Seymours pick her up? said Helen. Of course we must go and see her. Go they did. The very next day, Miss Sally's cup of happiness brimmed right over. For Cousin Abner's girls came to Golden Gate at last. They were very nice to her, too. Indeed, in spite of a good deal of snobbishness and false views of life, they were good-hearted girls under it all. And some plain common sense they had inherited from their father came to the surface and taught them to see that Miss Sally was a relative of whom anyone might be proud. They succumbed to her charm, as the others had done, and thoroughly enjoyed their visit to Golden Gate. They went away promising to come often again, and I may say right here that they kept their promise, and a real friendship grew up between Miss Sally and Cousin Abner's girls, that was destined to work wonders for the latter, not only socially and mentally, but spiritually as well, for it taught them that sincerity and honest kindness of heart and manner are the best passports everywhere, and that pretense of any kind is a vulgarity not to be tolerated. This took time, of course, the Reed girls could not discard their snobbishness all at once, but in the end it was pretty well taken out of them. Miss Sally never dreamed of this or the need for it. She loved Cousin Abner's girls from the first, and always admired them exceedingly. And then it is so good to have your own folks coming as company, she told the Seymour girls. Oh, I am just in the seventh heaven of happiness. But, dearies, I think you will always be my favorites, mine and Juliana's. I've plenty of company now, and it's all thanks to you. Oh, no, said Mary quickly. Miss Sally, your company comes to you for just your own sake. You've made Golden Gate a veritable mecca for us all. You don't know, and you never will know, how much good you have done us. 
you are so good and true and sweet that we girls feel as if we were bound to live up to you, don't you see? And we all love you, Miss Sally. I am so glad, breathed Miss Sally with shining eyes. And so is Juliana. <laughs>